Hello. How are we doing? Now, this is just all updated, and it could be... Oh, that is that is out. Like, I've got everything else right, but I forgot to get this right. Yeah, the, uh, the office is looking a bit disorganized, but that's because I have just got back from being away for several days. And, um, what can I say? I'm off again quite soon. In fact, in seven days is my final live before Australia. So this is my second to last live before Australia. Hang on, let's see. No, third to last live before Australia, because the second last is on Sunday, and then the last one is glorious first of June. That's going to be fun. And I need to book a taxi. That's that's something I forget. I keep forgetting. I need to book a taxi. Hey, but where's the five? That's seven. I'm looking for five. Why is five so hard to find? So many reasons why. How are we all doing today? How are we are we all enjoying ourselves, enjoying life? How are we all doing? Hello, Jack Ray. Hello, Wayne. Hello, John Shea. Hello, Steve Clark. I know we're starting a little bit later than we were expecting today, but literally, I, I, I whilst I got back many hours ago, thanks to the lovely Dan, who was driving me home. <sighs> it is fun to be away from family for a while. You need to sort out so many, many things. But, you know, various things. All right. All right. Let's see. Nice to There is a Smith the British were the first to set up a concentration camp. Yeah, it's not entirely accurate. E there's all sorts of versions of concentration camps. I think the um, the meaning of concentration camp has also changed over time. In that some were uh, the original ones were set up were literally that just concentration camps, i.e., where we put a load of people together. And in the British case, it was where they found they died more by the fact the British were, the British Army are terrible logistics than anything, anything intentional. It's one of those annoying parts of human history that often we are worse to each other, not when we mean to be, but when we act, you know, when we actually just don't think. <sighs> I'm avoiding the the stuff you've seen this week, nine six eight one. Strongly. Hello, Dunrakan. Hello, Hello, the History Vanguard. Hello, Steve Clark. Hello, Blackburn Maximus. Hello, Abelzaski. Hello, Malaga. Hello, everyone. Let's see. Hello, Seneca Nero. How did you 40? Hello, History Vanguard. Hello, Stephen Richards. Hello, David Goulding. Hello, Barry Newman. Hello, Bidron. Hello, Shane Stoney. Hello, Just Funk. Well, how have I posted an Aussie schedule? Well, Good thing you asked that one, because what I can do, I can do something for you all right now. When it comes to posting an Aussie schedule, I have an Aussie schedule that is right as of now. And uh, da -da 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 -da. I can put that up right about now. Community. Add an image. Select from my computer. Da -da 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 -ba 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 -da -ba -da -da uh, naval history. That one. Oh, good lord, my. D oh, I've I've got to say that off. Remind me, there are three things I need to remember to do before tomorrow, and one of them is send a message to my good and dear friend Drakenfell, going, "Can I have my portable hard drive back? I need it for Australia." <laughs> And before you think I'm being rude, really no, I, the the footage from Canada was on there, and so I gave it to him before he did his vi his videos, and I've just forgotten to ask him for it back since, and now it's reaching the point at which I really do actually need it. So, Fifth oh five 
2023. Um, I should say that we are sorting things out on end of preview. Do -do -do -do. We are sorting some things out, but yeah. There will be now, if you go to the community tab, preferably not now while I'm live talking to you, but if you go to the community tab on this channel, you should find at the top a post which has up-to-date Australia timetable as of 25th of the 5th, 2023, which has the dates and days of when we are there. You'll notice I have not left the... I've put random dinners and evenings. I haven't filled in the evening tabs yet. That's because we're still sorting them out. There are various things being considered. There's even the fact that some people have come back to us and asked us for a list of presentations we might give if they would like an inventive, should they put one on for us? And therefore, that could uh, that could be changing things. So that's why I haven't put in the evening activities yet. I've just put in what we're into doing the daytime. So basically, that's where we are between roughly 1,100 hours and 1,800 hours. Now, I will say one thing. In Brisbane, they aren't open to the public on the Tuesday. We are getting in on the Tuesday, but they're not open to the public on the Tuesday on HMS Dan Diamantina. However, they're letting us to go in and do filming. They are looking, letting us go in on the Wednesday to talk to the public and do some public uh, and do some sort of public-facing history. We are looking forward to both that. Uh, both that, but we're getting the, so. If you turn up on the Tuesday, you won't be able to get in and see us because no one's allowed in but us. But as I understand at the moment, uh, but on the Wednesday. It's gonna be more. Fun. It's gonna be a case of hello. We're here to chat with you and talk to you about ships. I have changed out of the orange shirt, Dan. I have because, as much as I loved the orange shirt, I was not gonna wear the orange shirt into my office. Because if I start wearing formal wear in here to teach you all from here, talk to you all from here, or to teach from here in formal wear, I will never get. But I will always have to do so. So, because once I get into my head, that's what I do. That's what I will always do. And I rather like the idea of being comfortable in my office. So t-shirt is what I've gone into. <laughs> Regarding that today's topic, you saw it. They don't make our people an admiral because of their pretty eyes. Well... This is where it would have been easier to have actually if we had been late this evening, Dan, and if I had had to put the recorded video on first, because then people could have seen the recorded video. Um, there is a different phrase for a useful idiot. A useful idiot is not necessarily someone who is a moron or an idiot or one of those phrases which we tend to use to describe so, uh, in that sort of sensiology. A useful idiot is someone who... No matter what their competency or intelligence, you wind them up, they'll go do exactly what you want. Nothing more, nothing less. They are people who you are find easy to take advantage of. In some regards. And Luchens... Well... Luchens is... an interesting gentleman in that regard. He really is. Hello, Longbow. Hello, everyone. How are we all doing? Ba -da -da -da. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I am just opening up something. Hello, Leslie. Uh, um, well, he was certainly not a devoted Nazi. I know there's a lot of press given to him being a devoted Nazi, but he wasn't. Uh, in the nicest way, there are several things he does which definitely say he's definitely not a devoted Nazi. In fact, he actively opposes the Nazis in several points. However, he is put in a situation where, in the nicest way, admirals... It's, it's kind of a difficult situation. Okay, and we'll get into that one. He can't do anything other than what he does. But I wouldn't say he's a devoted na uh, devoted follower. He's... 
How do I put this? He's a patriot, not a nationalist. And he's an ardent patriot. Jack Ray, what if they are know the role you want them to play, you ask them to do it, and they do it? Knowing the situation will wind them up and does they are the hammer you are, want to apply to the task. Then I suppose they're... I don't know. If there's someone who willingly goes and does the task, they're a follower. If there's someone who goes and does the task because... They're never going to question the going otherwise because of that. That's their their view of themselves. Then you can argue they're a useful idiot, because even if they disagree with you, they'll do what they do, they'll do what you want them to do. It's a bit like being having to be a party member to actually get somewhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, military officer, dedicated navy, chain of command, such. Yes, but you have to be careful because when you start talking about anything to do with Nazi Germany. And World War Two, the moment you use the phrase "devoted follower," that is also that is tends to be interchangeable with Nazi, and so you have to be precise, and you have to be precise in your description of people and what they do and what they get up to. And someone who is one of the few admirals who writes a note opposing the Nuremberg laws and basically demanding that Raider oppose them, and various other things. Is does not strike me as an ardent Nazi. There are many things he is. But, and the, the, the thing is, I would argue is, um, he's probably one of the first to realise that German intelligence is absolutely terrible. Hello, Paul Amos. All is well. So, before we get into too many things, so I wanted to quickly chat with people about. But before we begin, I wanted to quickly chat with people about thank you again for all the support coming for Australia. Um, thank you to all the support coming in. It really does mean a lot. And where are we? It's worthwhile considering where is ship shape at this precise point. Ship shape is currently doing pretty darn well. But what can I say? We have enough. We do have enough. That we are bringing, as mentioned, Garius. We have raised 17 and seven, roughly 17 grand and we are hopeful to still get to the 28 because that would make things a lot easier. But, yeah, we've got all that going on, so now we're off to Australia. What are we going to be doing? Well, this is where a lot of you come in because, as I mentioned earlier, we're organising things in the evening. So, if people would like to help us with organising dinners, that'd be a great thing. I've already, we've already had some people contact Drac, and I'm sure some will get in contact with me. And it's great if they do because I'm putting together the diary and trying to sort all that out. So frankly, more power. Anyone who's happy to contact us and help us out, that's great. But we're also putting to, uh, getting in contact with local historical societies, with all the other organisations, and the please. The thing I would like to say is. We are... How do I put this politely? Okay. We're British coming to Australia. We love Australia. 
But we don't have the local knowledge. We don't know necessarily all the local historical societies because some of the historical societies which we should be talking to do not have easy to work out names with all the Google foo in the world. But I found out very quickly that the society which I was hunting for, which I will not name names because they're very lovely and I'm not going to spoil it by saying it, um, did not have a name which was anything to do with what I thought it should be considering a geographic location. And I only found out what they were actually called when I was talking to someone who happened to be a friend of mine who comes from that area of Australia who went, oh yeah, they're called this. And I went, oh, thank you. That's, that's, that's helpful, and then I can answer questions on it. So, we, I leave on the 2nd of June to go to Australia. Drac and Dan leave on the 4th of June to head to Australia. We start off with possibly a dinner or something on the 6th of June in the evening. We then, the 7th and 8th of June, hopefully we're going to be with the Western Australian Maritime Museum. Uh, the 8th is going to be at the Museum of the Great Southern, we're hoping, and the 7th is going to be at the Sh Muse Maritime and Shipwrecks Museums. Uh, then we are going to go to Melbourne, where we're going to go to HMAS Castlemaine, Bathurst Class Corvette, and then we're going to go to Polly Woodside. Now, Polly Woodside is run by the National Trust of Australia. They are a lovely organisation, but... And I have had very positive dealings with them so far, so I'm hoping it continues. But I know we're doing Castlemaine. Then we have we attend, then we head from Brisbane, ahead to Brisbane. And Gareth arrives in Sydney on the 13th to help set up the stuff in Sydney. So Gareth is getting into Sydney early. So anyone who wants to meet up with him and help him out in getting and prepping for us arriving in Sydney, that's going to be good because Sydney is going to be packed. Whilst we're in Brisbane with HMS Diamantina and the Queensland Maritime Museum, which is a lovely museum which needs a lot of support, and we will be doing everything we can to make sure they get as much support as they can. And thank you, Bitron, for the five pounds for the ship trip to Australia, uh, for the Australia trip. Thank you. And then we're off to that. We have Australia. We have when we go to Sydney. We have the Royal Fleet Aero Museum on the 16th. And then the 17th, 18th, 19th and 20th, we currently have mainly allocated to the Australian National Maritime Museum. Now, there is the possibility we get through that more quickly. But they do have roughly 20 ships. They have roughly 20 ships. So, we do think that we will possibly need the entirety of what we've allocated, which is a Saturday... A Sunday, a Monday, and a Tuesday to it. I've also left a Wednesday free, because Drac heads home on the 21st. Me and Gareth head to Canberra on the 22nd. We do Canberra's Australian War Memorial on the 23rd. And then I head to Perth. Gareth heads to Sydney. I go home on the 26th, arrive home on the 27th. Gareth heads home on the 27th, arrives home on the 28th. So, that is our June. That is, our, the, sh that is the trip. I haven't put in the evening stuff there because there is going to be some evening stuff and not, it's not all being confirmed. I said some of it's going to be some talks, etc. And all the talks are going to be advertised and open and we're going to hopefully have lots of people along and hopefully you're going to be able to come, uh, anyone who wants to come along can be come along and enjoy them. And we hopefully will get permission to record them as well. So you'll get to see them and hear them. And yes, uh, the Australian National Maritime Museum in Sydney is massive. And we cannot overstate the absolute pleasure it has been to work with them. Them and their team are, I, I'm not sure I can say bending over backfoot backwards, but they were because we have tried to keep what we have to causing the minimum of trouble. But I am fairly certain that if we required of them to perform a pretzel maneuver with their bodies, they would have done it because they couldn't be more lovely. How's the restrictions? Jack Ray, have the headphones arrived? The headphones have arrived. Uh, I haven't got them out yet. They lit I literally got home and I found them, but I haven't opened them up and tested them yet because I've been prepping for this evening. Uh, 
So yes, the headphones have arrived. They look really quite cute. So the headphones have arrived. And thank you for them, Jack. <laughs> uh, might as well. So, context matters. That's why a deep study of history is useful. It's useful to explain why things happened and what uh, help the past impact the future. True. Engage strategy. Hello, engaging strategy. Hello, everyone. Enough. With Luchens, I don't think he's the type of personality that would survive the political machinations of Germany in the Navy in the latter part of the war if he'd somehow made it back to Germany. If he'd somehow made it back to Germany, he would be the likely successor to Raider over Donitz. Because he would be that successful. If he has made it back from two trips, remember, he's take Operation Berlin, he takes Scharnhorst and Eisenhower around. That's not a necessarily bad trip for them. And yeah, if he's done two trips, he, he's he, and he comes back, he's doing well in the German high command. Cool history vanguard. So here is Jan Gunther Lutschens. British camera sounds like a fun trip, but they don't have an hourly high-speed rail service descending. Still a Victorian railway, Amazon. Um, no, we're flying. We're flying to Canberra. We did consider driving it, but then we can then we realised we'd have to drive the car back, and we just decided to fly. Just easier to fly. The group, the squad, the squad, do you mean that the Melbourne neighborhood has decided something like the Devonshire County Meteorological Appreciation Group? No, I mean like one of, uh, like almost every other one of their societies seems to be named after someone rather than, i.e. the Naval History Society, it would be the, I don't know, the Drakenfell Society or the Dan Freeman Society, and that's local Naval History Society. I love them, but they are fun. So, he lived the 25th of May, 1889, to the 27th of May, 1941. So, today is his birthday. Today is Johann Gunther Lutschen's birthday. So, most people were talking about it yesterday. They were talking about the loss of Hood. Or they'll be talking about the sinking of Bismarck on Saturday. But today is his birthday. Today is this man's birthday. So it seemed appropriate, if we're going to look at it, to look at it today. Bang what if Luchens was captured alive by the British? Um, I don't think he'd have allowed himself to be captured alive. But if he had been seriously injured enough that he had not been awake when he'd been captured... It's hard to say. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Vanguard. So he served from 1907 to 1941. He served in Freya, Württemberg, Koenig, Wilhelm, and Hansa. As his tra as his ships uh, first training up, and then he did some time in torpedo boats, the G one six nine, G one seven two, and he would be with torpedo boats for pretty much most of the rest of his career. Thank you, Brandon. That's very kind of you. If you look at the torpedo boats he's serving in, he has a lot of experience with those, and he does a lot, has a lot of World War One experience, and he's a good commander of small boats, and that is part of the problem for Luchens, because he is a very good commander of small boats, so he gets promoted, and eventually he gets to Karlsruhe, but that's the la uh, the only large ship he commands. Look at it, there. His in uh, his entire command experience is a year and a single world cruise in charge of a light cruiser. A terribly badly designed light cruiser as well. That's his 
sh uh, his large vessel command experience. He served on them, but that's his large command experience, command experience. Vision. Did the film sink the Bismarck delusion and injustice by making a super a, a 2D super Nazi? Yes. They did. And you'll be hearing exactly why. And then we have Chief of Personnel a Chief of the Personnel Office, then Commander Torpedo Boats, Commander Scouting Forces, and then Fleet Commander. Basically, yes, he was Knight 6831. If you consider, he actually ended up in charge of operations off the coast of Norway because Marshal Alt was ill. And then he ends up taking over the operations permanently because Marshal is got rid of because he actually decides to attack HMS Glorious instead of following orders. He was not supposed to be where he was. And then he does the operation with... With the uh, with the Sean Orson Ice now, and mostly that ha gets away because Tovey is a bit of a, mm, and Tovey doesn't realise that they're out, and so keeps presuming, oh, it's only it's only a heavy cruiser out. It's not it's not anything bigger than a heavy cruiser. It's only a heavy cruiser. It's only a heavy cruiser, and then finds out afterwards it's not only a heavy cruiser. Oh sugar, I would say. Most of his great successes come down more to Tovey occasionally being less than sensible than they do to his brilliance. And the trouble is, because he does survive, because he does get through to things, he's considered, well, he's put up on a bit of a pedestal. But there again, he's not the most stupid commander they have. By a, longer, a long, large margin. He's really not. This man is many things. And he is many things. And there are naval officers who are absolute ardent Nazis. There are. But there is also the fact that the Navy is always to an extent distrusted because they were the sites of the first rebellions and the stabbing in the back by some of the army, including... Hitler tended to not like them a bit because of that. And furthermore, there's the fact that the Navy weren't invested in, like the Army or the, you know, other formations. And this meant... How do I put this politely? This meant they were nece not nece as necessarily as lovingly disposed towards... The Nazis, as any as others were. Films don't tend to like sympathetic villains. They like things nice to be easy. In reality, is never so easy. Reality is never so easy. Uh, John South, between the wars, Navy was also more likely to meet foreigners and get other points of view. Not really. Let's think about this. Because... That's his sole interwar command. Other than that is torpedo boats. So if he does meet foreigners, they're coming to him, not him going to them. And he's not alone. So. 
He becomes a Lieutenant Zersi. On the 20th of September, 1910. He'd entered the, the Kaiserlich Marine as a sea cadet, midshipman, uh, sort of thing, in 1907. And he had a good career. He had a very good career. Serving aboard as a lieutenant, he served aboard the... Uh, well, serving as a lieutenant to sea came after he'd already c completed some experience as an infantryman in his se a second sea battalion tour. Uh, in fact, he'd done that twice. The, the the German Navy really liked to send their, arm, their naval officers to go for infantry courses. Um, they were all good infantry officers. Now, after receiving his commission as Lieutenant of Sea, he served on board the Koenig William. That's the ship picture, I don't think I mentioned that one. And he served on board that from the 26th September 1910 to the 1st of April 1911. It was a harbour ship by this point. Then he went to the Hansa, which he served aboard from 1911 till 1913. Now, the Hansa is an interesting vessel. It does world cruises. That's what it's used for. So when he is serving a bonnet, uh, aboard it between 1911 and 1913, it is doing a world cruise. He actually sails around that world about twice before he goes on to senior command. This is the thing. This is the massive difference you see between the German Navy of the pre-World War One and the German Navy post-World War One. Pre-World War One, they're sailing around the world. They've got presence missions going off all around the world. They, they're doing all sorts of things. Post-World War One, they're not. They're not because they can't. Uh, we'll get to that question later, Stephen, on Richard's on that one. Now, he seemed to have had a good career and enjoyed his time aboard the Koenig Wilhelm. He then went on further world cruises. And in fact, I think he'd actually completed three world cruises on the hands of I said two earlier. He completed two after the Koenig Wilhelm. He did one in between April 1911 and 1913. And then he did another two um, before World War One began. His assignment after this, he's promoted to Oberlieutenant Ober Zersi, or Sub-Lieutenant, on the 27th of September, 1913. And his assignment after that point, well... I am getting through these slides on a fair pace, because I know the longer ones, the later slides I'm going to be taking a longer over. His next assignment was with the 4th Torpedo Boat Flotilla, and this is what he starts to get his career in. Okay? He's considered a smart officer. He's gone to artillery school. He's gone to naval artillery school. He's gone to torpedo school. He has been an instructor of cadets. He's considered a very good small boatman, and that's where he's being trained as, and that's what he's being pushed towards. Because, think about it, they don't have many officers aboard these ships. They don't have... Many personnel will these ships. You need someone who's smart, who's an all-rounder, and who's going to take leadership roles, don't you? Because these ships do not have much. They really don't have much 
in terms of capabilities. <laughs> oh, good lord, yeah. Now, he starts out as a watch officer in 1913. In October 1913, he's appointed company officer with the 1st Torpedo Division. Served as a watch officer on a tube of torpedo boat G169 of the 2nd Torpedo Boat Demi Flotilla from 1st November. And then from 24th of December 1913, he returned to his position as a company officer with the 1st Torpedo Division before becoming a watch officer on G172 of the 2nd Torpedo Boat Demi Flotilla on 15 March 1914. On the 1st of August 1914, he was transferred, well, he was transferred to the Harbour Flotilla of the J. Blight and promoted in command of T-68 of 6th uh, Torpedo Boat Demi Flotilla. This is, this is confirmed on the 4th of September 1914. In December... So if you think about that, he's gone from being a watch officer... As of September 1913, to being in command of a torpedo boat within a year. In fact, he was made a watch officer on the 27th of September 1913, or roughly thereabouts, and he becomes a commander of a torpedo boat, the T 68, on the 4th of September 1914, so less than a year, by a few days. He loses that command then, and on the 7th of December 1914, returns to the 1st Torpedo Division, attends a minesweeping course. After completion of his course, he goes back and he takes command of the training torpedo boat T-21 on 16th of January 1915. So, it was a two-week course. He'd serve in charge of the training torpedo boat until the 14th of March... Uh, no, 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 that was the 16th of March, 16th of January, 1915. I think I said 1916. And that's the, and then he served in this position until the 14th of March, 1915, when he's posted back to 1st Torpedo Division. And on the 5th of May, he was transferred to the Torpedo Flotilla Flandern, serving as commander of torpedo boats A-50 and A-20. So by May 1915, i.e. less than two years into being posted to torpedo boats, He's in charge of a pair of torpedo boats. And he's then appointed chief of a demi flotilla in the second torpedo boat flotilla planned in, in, in February 1916, which basically means he's in charge of half the flotilla. And he's also put in charge of A40. And he'll hold this position until the 11th of November, November 1918. So, from the fe so from February nineteen sixteen onwards to November nineteen eighteen, so a little over two and a half years, he will spend as deputy commander of a torpedo boat flotilla. Now let's consider the boat he's commanding. He at this point will be commanding A-40, which was a Batch 2A class. Now Batch 2A class displaced between 227 and 229 tons. By the way, this is a Batch 3 pictured, which is 330 to 335 tons. So it's over 100 tons heavier than his one. So remember that one. He spends most of his war career in a boat which is 230 tons i.e. it's a rounding error on the Bismarck. In displacement. They have a length of roughly 49 metres, a beam of roughly 5.5 metres, 
a draft of roughly 2.4 meters. They have an oil-fired, single-shafted gear turbine system, uh, power, power sort of system. So, um, an oil-fired boiler supplying a single gear turbine to drive a single shaft to give them a top speed of 25 knots. They have a range of 690 nautical miles at 20 knots and a crew of 29. Their armament is two 88mm guns and a single 18-inch torpedo tube, and they have the ability to lay mines. That is the vessel he spends his World War I on. This is it. Eh, things happen. So roughly the size of the CPU yacht, but it looks better. Um, uh, I'm not sure about it looking better. But there is a small problem here. What do we think officers are like in this scenario? Do you have to have many people you're going to share your judgment with on this kind of ship? Because think about it. As an officer in this ship, who do you share your thought process with? What's your command experience going to be like? Do you have necessarily an executive officer running around you can share everything with, or are they going to be busy? How many officers are you going to have on this ship? Two? Three? One, in, uh, one is the chief engineer. Maybe another officer aboard to help you with some of the, uh, some of the stuff going on. But he could well be dealing with a torpedo. The guns are going to be run by chiefs. Most of the ships are going to be run by NCOs. You are a young officer who are probably who's probably years younger, if not decades younger than your senior NCOs. Who is there on here for you to really start to can express questions with about tactical situations? There are lots of people you can learn from. But again, this is the German imperial system and they've sent you to infantry school. So what kind of experience is this going to train you for to be as a senior officer? Think about it. Because if you're in the Royal Navy, you would go off and command, so you would have in the interwar years plenty of time to go and command destroyers and maybe cruisers and get the experience in them. Maybe you'd even be given a battleship if you're particularly promising and they'd put a lot of officers around you and you get used to dealing with a larger crew, a larger organization. But he hasn't got this experience. So when I read some of the lines written about him, about him being bad at command, not communicating with people, not telling them what he was thinking, I sit there and go, well, what do you expect? What's his experience been? What's his training been? Here is one of the things I often point out to people. Some people will loudly say, oh, I was never taught to be a leader. I was born to be a... I, I, I'm the way I was born. Well, not really. You are usually a product... Your leadership skills are usually a product of the environment you lead in. If you've been lucky enough to have training, to have someone show you and guide your roots, you've probably picked up some of the skills off them. But, but, and I say this as a glorious glutamus maximus, in the whole scenario, you are never just the product of you. You're always partially a product of how you reacted to the scenario you're in. He's in a scenario where he cannot does not have people to communicate with. So he's not going to get used to the idea of communicating. And unless you put him in a scenario where he's forced to communicate with people, he's not going to get any better at it because he's used to that. A certain set of training was inadequate. Yeah. Or rather, it was adequate because, again, the German Navy is putting him through this, but the German Navy is not that it's a Navy of the pre-World the inter of the pre -World War One Navy which is setting this up. And they have cruisers. They have other ships he would have been sent off to command. Let's be honest. He would not have spent the remaining interwar years, most of the next 20 years, and I'm going to go through this now, 
not in command of a ship if he'd been in the pre-war German Navy. He certainly wouldn't have done this in the Royal Navy, because let's look at this. He finishes World War I as a Capitan Lieutenant. He serves in this role, and it's, that's, it's, to me, it's kind of like the Germans have divided up the rank of Lieutenant Commander, because that is the only way I can make sense of some of the positions he does. Because he serves as the head of the, of the Wanamud and Lubeck Sea Transportation Agency between December and uh, 1918 and September 1919. Brief interlude in the German Imperial Naval Office. Then he's posted the Coastal Depart Defense Department. Three, later four, in Cuxhaven, Lehe, as company commander. Then, in January 1921, he did duty as, uh, well, the staff at the, of the North Sea. Then, he transfers to the Fleet Department of the Naval Command on 7th of June 1921, serving as the Fleet Department under, uh, of the head of the Fleet Department under Admiral Paul Beneke until September 1923. This included observation analysis of the Washington Naval Conference. So, so far, he's basically from 1918 onwards to 1920, 4th October 1923, he hasn't been back to sea. He hasn't had that experience. He hasn't had another command experience. He's had a staff posting. Staff command. And yes, yeah, staff command is an experience. But it's very different from sea command. You think about it. If you're on a staff at home and you're doing an admin job, what do you have? You have a boss who will come and have a chat with you if you're not doing something right. You have... A you have a team all around you. You probably have to deal with a load of civilians as well as military, and you probably go home and sort out with what talk to people and have a bit of a social life. There are all sorts of options for people to go and talk to that you don't have aboard a ship. You can go and talk with your peers. He can't do that. What can you do when you're aboard a ship? Who can an admiral talk to aboard a ship? Who can a captain talk to aboard a ship? Who can they talk to? On the 4th of October 1923, he took command of the third to uh, torpedo boat Demi Flotilla. Chef, uh, chief, the, to uh, the, the uh, torpedo boat Al Flotilla. Flotilla. And he was in this post until the 26th of September 1925. So basically, he has another couple of years almost in charge of torpedo boats. He had a lot of experience with that, but he's gone back for a couple of more years. And then he became first adjutant of the Marine Station of the, on the North Sea, i.e. the North Sea Naval Station. He served this role until the 2nd of October 1929, barring a uh, brief period after his promotion to Corvetti Capitan, where he went off for a month sailing in the yacht Augusta, uh, or Asta in August 1926. Yes, he's been promoted to Corvetti Capitan. He, he's been promoted to the official equivalent of the Lieutenant Commander, and yeah, he so far all he's commanded is torpedo boats. He married in age twenty in nineteen twenty nine at the age of forty. Third of October nineteen twenty nine, Luchens was appointed to command the first torpedo boat flotilla, Chef the Torpedo Flotilla in Swinemund. Uh this he commanded until the seventeenth of september nineteen thirty one. So, he gets another couple of years. Of torpedo boats. And if you think about that, he's reached the rank of Lieutenant Commander, and that's 1926. Uh, 
I was asking, Albert can, t Aaron can talk to the ships, Captain. I'd say XO is fake Sheridan Chief Petty Officer. Really? Well, it'll be an interesting scenario. We'll be talking about that later. And we're talking about the reality of this in the next slide a lot. Now, after this, he's called by Eric Greider to become the naval commander of the Ministry of the Light Sphere. Where, after less than a month, he's promoted to frigate and captain, and commander, on the 1st of October 1931, serving the 1st Department Head of the Fleet and Naval Officer Personnel Department, and on the 26th of September 1932, appointed Chief of Department. He's promoted to Captains of Sea, i.e. full captain, on the 1st of July 1933, and continued in the post till September 1934. Let's think about that. He has managed to go... To captain. Full captain. And he has not served at sea in anything other than in command of torpedo boat flotillas. Since 1913. Twenty years in naval service. And all he's been to sea in is torpedo boat flotillas. He's a fine artillery officer. This is one thing you would have to say to him. Look, it, you, you have to know, Lutyens is a fine artillery officer. He's a fine officer. In fact, he would have probably been a very good captain of Bismarck. And he'd probably been a very good captain. Well, we'll get into it. Um, there's a reason why I don't think it's necessarily sensible the organisation that set up him for Bismarck. Yes, Dunrick Eisenhower. He was. But no, this is his experience. And this is his first big ship command. Oh, the cold through. Oh. I don't know. Now, it was January 1933 when Hitler had come to power. And it's September 1933 when Lutyens receives command of the Karlsruhe. His purpose in charge is to sail around the world for goodwill visits. Sail around the world. And well, sorry. Uh, that's what he goes and does. You think about that. He sailed around the world three times prior to World War One. Twenty years before he does it again. <clears throat> Jack Wright, could he have seen more sea service at the time? No. This is the problem for the German Navy. You think you go through and go, well, you know, they're allowed fifteen thousand personnel of which one and a half thousand are officers. Yes, they are. That sounds like a large number. It's not really a large number. 
Not if you want to maintain enough kernel of officers to be a balanced fleet and to grow the fleet at some point. And you start thinking through how are you going to employ those 1,500 officers? What are you going to have them doing? Where are they going to go? What are they going to be? The Treaty of Versailles. Yeah. This vessel, of course, is uh, one of those particular vessels which I have particular fun with because it has the alternating side aft 6-inch guns. Oh, happy days. It has the heavy aft armament of 6 6-inch six guns are firing aft. And there are many reasons for this. Some of them are even legitimate reasons. But none of them are actually logical once you work through it. <sighs> this is just... no. No. It is, of course, a Koenigsberg class, otherwise known as just enough metal around her hull to set off any explosions coming in. Mm. I don't, know if I don't even think the German Navy was prepared to play with cavalry ships at all. The German Navy wasn't really prepared to play for anything with war. They hadn't had the time to prepare for war. They hadn't. Their fleet wasn't ready for war. Lombok. Nuremberg does Nuremberg things. Yeah. These display 7,800 tons. Had two man 10 cylinder diesel engines and four geared steam turbines to drive two um, shafts. So basically, each shaft was powered by either two geared steam turbines or you had a diesel engine. So you basically had diesel steam power. It's a fun thing. It's a really fun thing. But this is the vessel he sails around the world. And he does. And it's while he's on this vessel that you actually get is the only photo of him doing a version of the um, Nazi Party salute. And that comes from his visit to Cali in Colombia. Now, one of the interesting things is while he's in charge of this ship, you really do get to see experience of him as an officer and his kind of command style. Because think about leadership styles and how they integrate with teams. Honey. Oh, that I've been coming for a while. Excuse the French. I know some people don't like it when I burp. I do apologize. I wasn't meaning to. And strange enough, this is actually, as young master, Dan also decided the first gassy drink I've had all day. So, I don't think it's that. It's probably because I shoveled down dinner earlier, as quickly as I could after I got home. Anyway, leaving that to one side. There are roughly three types of ways leaders tend to interact with their teams in a non- leadership profile. Think about it. You either have someone who comes and buys drinks for everyone. Add a lot of bias. You know, big personality brings them in together and goes, come on everyone, let's have a chat. Let's all get together. Let's eat some food. Let's come on. Let's, you know, you know, the one who wants to turn anything which isn't a formal meeting into a party. The other option is the one who goes, hmm, I'm going to slowly work through my team and interact with them one on one. I'm going to, I don't know, uh, 
I used to work with a boss who basically tried to take everyone out in twos and threes from the team and would slowly work through. So basically would, if they're on a project together, would go, well, let's go discuss this over lunch and would take that project team out. Have lunch with them, chat with them and try and do it that way to build up a personal rapport. And there were others who would read stuff. And they would basically try and get to know their team by just reading reports about them. Now then, this also filters into what style of officer are you. Because if you're the style of officer who tends to learn by reading... Okay, which group do you think you're going to be when it comes to leadership? If you're the type of officer who learns by picking out a couple of good people who really know what they're doing and picking their brains, what kind of officer are you likely, what kind of leadership style are you going to likely to, uh, to apply? And if you're the kind of officer who tends to gather everyone round, have a huddle and go, come on people, what do I need to know? What kind of officer or leadership are you model are you going to do? You start thinking through these because leadership models apply to more than just the chain of command. One of the thing, interesting things about the military and one of the reasons why I often think it's terrible when people go, oh, you must be a good leader, you've been in the military, is I go, well, no, you have a very, very scripted position in the military in terms of your leadership role within your post. It's largely set in order to buy precedent. Yes, there are variations. Yes, you are allowed to put your own personality in. Yes, hopefully good officers will put their own personality in and adapt it greatly. And most of the best ones do. And the ones I really like meeting have done. But you can also skate over a lot of personal issues by just leaning back on this is what I'm supposed to do in situation X. Or why happens so I do Z. I don't know, I'm going to blame you for not having enough sort of sticky stuff for putting at lunch. I had two pieces. You had about four. That room, leadership as academic subject is divorced from authority. Ah, fun times. No. Um, Longboat, the D ships had diesel and steam power. So basically, you could run. You had diesel engines to give you a cruising speed. Then, if you wanted to go high speed, you turned on the boilers. You powered up the steam burner, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the oil, bo uh, the oil bo bo fire boilers. You powered up the steam turbines. And they all pl they all plugged into the same shafts. So you had two shafts, which could be driven by up to two steam tur uh, two geared turbines and a diesel engine. So, on this world tour, and this is the point you sort of start to think about it. What's he got a chance to do? He's got a chance to train those young officers, train the officers aboard, and to learn his experience. So, having heard what I've talked about with Luchins before, what do you think style of learning officer is, is? Do you think he's going to go off and read books? And do you think he's going to go off and talk to individuals? Do you think he's going to get everyone together and go, come on, people, what do you think I need to know? Remember, he's raised in the Kaiserlich Marine. He's been through infantry school. He spent his career in torpedo boats. People, what do we think he's going to be? And what, before you answer quickly, I'm going to put in a, I'm going to put in a little poll, okay? So the poll is going to be, add an option, is he, the, uh,
So, I'm gonna set the poll should be running now. That's what you have two, Dan have four. You're burping, Dan isn't. QED. Yeah, I suppose that's right. Dagdrum, it reminds me of how most of the good generals in ACW were mainly found in lower class, in the American Civil War, mainly found in lower, lower class ranks than in top at West Point. Education takes you so far. I'd say it's not just the education factor, I'd say it's also the ability to learn from experience. How can you be an introvert and turn and roll into a torpedo road? You can't really be an introvert, but you can be in your head. So, I'm going to end poll, and I'm, by the way, I'm going to wait till I see my own hand doing the 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. So I'm going to end poll in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, end poll. So we've got Go Reads Books, 56%. Small Chats, 31%. Group Discussion, 12%. Well, you are right in the exact right order. His style of leadership is he goes and tries to read books and files and information to learn about what he needs to do as commanding of a light cruiser. And he also has small chats. He goes and picks out people who he thinks are very knowledgeable and who are best for him to inform or get advice from, and he goes and has chats with them. He doesn't do the big group discussions. He doesn't really like doing that. And he hasn't ever really liked doing that. That isn't his form of leadership. Now, this is not necessarily a bad methodology of learning or a bad methodology of leading. It's just... not exactly possible to carry out as things get bigger. If you think about that, if you have a torpedo boat and you only have two or three officers including yourself aboard and two or three chief petty officers aboard, chief petty officer equivalents, including yourself aboard, it's kind of easy to organize a small dinner, isn't it? You pick, you, you, you know, you take the officers or you take the chiefs and that's your small dinner. You're used to that. Reading books is also an option because, let's be honest, you have nothing else to do with your time because they have no extra space aboard. There's no drinking club or drinking facility on this boat. Let's be honest, even the... Even this one, which is a hundred tons heavier than his was. A hundred tons heavier. And had a crew... Uh, you know, it's a, it's a whopping compliment. It has 50 instead of 29. This has 21 more people aboard it than his did. And weighed a hundred tons more than his did. You know, that's going to ha you know there's there's not really much of an option to develop the the sort of the style of the big group discussion leadership. But if you think about it, what kind of leadership do you want for a battleship? Think about what you need to command something which is a larger organization. What kind of leader you want. If you've got a small organization, having a person... Who, if you've got a small organization of just a few people, going reading books is probably the most sensible leadership style you can have in terms of learning and learning up because, well, let's be honest, there's no one probably in the organization for you to learn from because you're each probably doing your own silos. 
when you've got a medium-sized organization or some medium to small it's probably the small chats you can probably do that and cut do be felt to be a perfectly adequate leader once you start growing to a medium to large organization it's going to be the group discussions and eventually it's going to be there are you're going to have to be dependent doing group discussions with other leaders who are going to have to be doing group discussions with other leader uh, with other leaders who are going to be doing the group discussions with the wider organization because there's no way you can get all those people in the same room What do you mean a naughty flag is on the screen? I didn't know there was a naughty flag on the screen. Mm. I'm presuming it's the fact that there are various symbologies going on in here. I'm presuming, he says. No? The one on the left. Um, here? Yeah? Because there's, I can only see, I can't see any sign like that. I can only see my screen thing here. I can't see anything as in there's a bad thing going on. Ah, eh, well, don't worry. Now, so he does the world tour. Oh, that's a Union Jack. Other left. Over here. There's something over here, is there? Well, I can't see it on any of my screens, so... Ugh. Anyway. He does this. He goes around. He's, you know, trying to lead his ship. And he's only on there for a year. And it could have been a time where he could have used, especially being a sort of the wider speaking office, to form a real group and do some training up of people. And one of the interesting things is the most senior officer to survive Bismarck's last battle were Bernard uh, Freria von Mullenheim uh, Reckenberg had been an officer cadet on the Karl Schrue. Kind of an interesting scenario. From the coronation. Anyway. All their routes, they sailed via Skagen, the Azores, Trinidad, um, Cape Horn, they went up the west coast of the South Middle of North America to Vancouver. Uh, they went to Calo. They joined in the 400-year celebration of Peru in, in, in Calo. Uh, Kalshu returned to Kiel on the 15th of June, 1935, traveling through the Panama Canal to Houston, Charleston, and then Vigo, Spain, before going home to Kiel. In June 1935, Lutyens met Donitz. Now, I would say I doubt it was their first meeting. Some sources try and claim it was their first meeting, but honestly, the German Navy has not been that big. And there aren't that many senior officers wandering around. So my fair view is that with the amount of time that Donitz and him had spent in staff, and with the fact that both of them are commanding cruisers at roughly about the same time, they probably have had some overlapping at certain points. 
Karlsruhe. Karlsruhe. Yeah, I keep calling it the Karlsruhe, and it's the Karlsruhe. Eh. Now, at this point, Raider informed Donitz not long after he got back that he was to become the chief of personnel officer of the Office of Personnel Branch Naval Headquarters again, tasked with rebuilding the officer corps. So he's promoted in 1936 and he becomes the chief of the personnel officer for the Kriegsmarine. In 1937, he became Führer, or a leader, de Torpedo Boat. Flagship was the Z1 Lebrak Mass. He's finally promoted to Contra Admiral in October 1937. Woohoo! He's made Rear Admiral in 1937. So let's think about this. He's made the uh, Rear Admiral in 1937. Prior to that, he has served in one year aboard a light, in charge of a light cruiser. Um, he has commanded a torpedo boat flotilla, been deputy commander of a torpedo boat flotilla in World War One and later on the interwar period, and mainly led torpedo boats. And now he is commander of the torpedo boats for the entire Navy from a destroyer, and he's been made a rear admiral. They are left over from the coronation, and I, yeah. I might take them down, I might just leave them there. They're kind of, I kind of like, I think they're cute. That's good. They'd known of each other, certainly if they hadn't met, but I agree, it's unlikely they wouldn't have met <laughs> informally in the course of their duties. Yes, it's very unlikely. There's just not enough of them. Ah, the end of the... Uh, the, uh, the Karlsruhe... The Karlsruhe... Uh, the Karlsruhe is not silent. Ah, so it's Karlsruhe. It's fun. But he is therefore returning to the personnel office which he's commanded before. Before he's put in charge of this. And then he's put in charge of the torpedo boats. Promoted to the Contra Admiral in October 1937. What is interesting to note. Whilst he was in command of the personnel department, he frankly ignored the Nuremberg laws on racing the Kriegsmarine. And how do I say he ignored this? Well, if anyone looked, they would have found that the law, the rules subscribing him to do stuff were sitting in his inbox. But like any good senior officer, he has a very large in-tray. And when he gets round to it in his in-tray, you know, it could take a long, long time. So nothing got done. Very soon after being promoted to a rear admiral. So he's literally been rear admiral for a little over a year. He's promoted in October 1937. In November 1938, he's one of only three flag officers, including Donitz, as one of the others, who protest in writing to Raider as Commander-in-Chief of the Navy against the anti-Jewish Kristallnacht programs. So, he doesn't just protest in person, he writes a letter and signs his own frigating name. So, in the nicest way, before anyone starts going, this was a, a gentleman was a dyed-in-the-wool Nazi, did this. You don't do this. You don't do this. You don't even do this if you're going along with them out of fear. Do you? Because if you're scared of them, you would not be putting your name on paper and writing a letter. So it's Karlsruhe? Hmm. Uh, 
How long after World War One did the German Navy start to expand again? Um, oof, 1936. So you're talking about 18 odd years. And if you think about it, the Royal Navy and the British had destroyed all their industries. So they didn't have the ability to build any guns bigger than 11 inch guns. But at that point, which is why Sean Austin and now have 11 inch guns, not because they're building battle cruisers, they're building battleships. It's just they can't build anything bigger than an 11 inch gun. So that's what they're fitted with. Um, at that time, because they haven't got the facilities. They haven't got the. They haven't built up. They've got the brain power. They haven't got the ability to. That's a, that's a massive. That's the issues going on. The Germans have. They've had their stuff taken away from them. They've got. Their dockyards, their native, their shipyards have been gutted. Everything's been gutted. It's so even aside the fact that they've also lost quite a lot of their infrastructure, which was in various other parts of Germany, which are no longer Germany by this point, because they were built when Germany ruled most of Poland, and now Poland was free. That's what that meeting might be the first time both men had that. Potentially, but... Hmm. <sighs> You've given up on Bless Wackia. Yeah. Bless Wackia. Yeah. Bless Wackia. Yeah. How about Maximus? How long would it have taken for Germany to recover industry if there was no World War II? Right then. So the most optimistic plan for F Plan Z delivery was 1945. The most realistic was about 1950. And that plan would have had to include a hefty dose of reconstruction of industry. So, yeah, you're looking at at least another few years. Because there is no way you can rebuild your industry... In three, in three, four years. Well, in three years, basically. Because it, basically it's starting in 1936. So there is no point. There's no way you can rebuild your navy in three years. And your maritime industry in three years. After 18 years of n nothing. So, what capital ships laid down early 30s and light cruisers? That's got how many were laid down. Think about that. It's taking a long time to build these ships. Yes, they're being laid down, but they're taking ages to build because there's not many facilities to build them. There's nothing there to support them, basically. So, yeah, they've started building these things, but again, how do I put this plainly? They're allowed, uh, building a, light, a couple of light cruisers does not help keep your industry going, does it? Especially not when you think about the light cruisers built. Ooh. Uh, building destroyers. They're yeah, good, but you're not building that many. Not The German fleet just isn't allowed to build enough to actually real build their navy. They're just not allowed to. Uh, 15, they were, it was about 1936 where they started ignoring the rules. So, the important point of this slide, well, that's his flagship. And the second important point is he sends this letter. It's worthwhile having there to evaluate him by. That's good. I was talking about you building anything more than you building a useful amount. Cross meanings. Um, yeah, well, they're not a useful amount, are they? You've built two capital ships. If you go to... Let, let's see. The Shan Horse class. They are laid down. 
1935, in June and May, in May and June 1935 is when the Shah Nosson Eisen are laid down. So they are laid down in the same year he's going around the world. That's when they're laid down. And then they are launched in October and December 1936. But they're commissioned in May 1938 and January 1939. So, from laying down to commissioning, in the case of Scharnhorst, takes... Well, let's be honest, it takes the best part of six plus... It takes the best part of 42 months. And the reason I'm saying this is because if we consider the British construction program, Okay, let's go to uh, Nelson and Rodney because they, oh, they have that. So Nelson class battleship, which is into all construction. Uh, they all take longer. Really, they're really stretched out. For that, let's look at someone who's actually building a pace uh, South Dakota class. Yeah, that'll be about a comment. So, if we consider the South Dakota, she's laid down in July 1939, launched June 1941, and commissioned March 1942. And, well, you can sort of work that one out. She's about six months... That's 40, 41, so that's 24 months, plus 6, 30 months. So she's roughly 33 months in construction. And let's be honest, a South Dakota is a lot bigger and a lot more complicated than a Sharnost. So I wasn't trying to suggest they were creating a new name unless it was a base, just that they were building anything was a sizable change from the 15 years since the Treaty of Versailles. Not really, because they'd always had some construction. They'd had the Emden they'd finished off and a few other things. The Germans hadn't been completely... Listened. That was the trick the British mainly used. They hadn't completely, in a nice way, stopped them doing any construction. they just left them with only being able to construction things which would not maintain their armour industry, not maintain their major armaments industry, and not give them enough ships. Government's got, got, got something to do with the German 15 inch development. It doesn't hurt. What happens though when war begins? Well, when World War I breaks out, there are issues. There are real issues. And Lutchens especially has some issues. At this point, he's made a commander of scouting forces. Bethel and Sheva, they're off Kalungstreker after. Which is made up of the Germans' destroyers, torpedo boats, and light cruisers. As such, he's an important person for the war against Poland. He really is. 
And whilst he's as surprised as any of the German commanders that there is actually a war against Poland, Well, he managed to get his vessel damaged. He decides to go and launch an attack on the Vicar and the, Gri uh, and the Griff. And, well, they're tied in up against Shaw, so he has to deal with Shaw batteries, and he doesn't get to either of them. He doesn't get to either of them. He managed to cause a little bit of damage, but mostly what he managed to do is get his own flagship beaten up sufficiently enough that he has to change to the Wilhelm Heimkamp, this vessel. And the uh, Lebrecht Mass has to go into um, Drydock to be repaired. Unfortunately, the uh, Wicker and the Griff get taken out by the Luftwaffe later on in the same day. However, he goes off and conducts a successful mine laying mission off the Humber to deal with the Leipzig uh, in the uh, Humber and then gets promoted to, to the Leipzig class pictured, Numrug, as his new, as his new um, flagship because he's promoted to Vez Admiral. So, let's consider that. He is promoted to Vice Admiral. And it is what? October 1939? Roughly, he's promoted to Vice Admiral. Roughly October 1939. So, he has been a Rear Admiral since October 1937. And two years later, he's a Vice Admiral. Two years later, he's a Vice Admiral. Think about that. And those aren't two years of war. That's a month of war. And once again, he's in light forces. And that's where his knowledge lies. If he, you know, he's commanded a light cruiser. He's... He's got. He's commanded torpedo boats. Light cruisers are his thing. They're what he's in charge of. What he's experienced of. What he knows. Oh my question, would there have been anyone else more suited to be promoted? Eh, eh, now, beep. That is the million dollar award. Well, it would be if I was uh, had a million dollars to give out. Um, Longbow, because that's the problem. There is no one else to be promoted. So he's the only option available to be promoted to command these forces. They are expanding their torpedo boats. They are expanding their destroyers. They are trying to enter in as much of these forces as possible. And yet... They don't have any better options. He is the person who has built up their destroyer arm. He is the person who has commanded their light forces. I was asking if they dug up and reanimated Hippo. That's pretty much your only option because Luchens is the best of the bad of the options they've got. It's basically like saying... Okay. So, I have some mince pies here. And I have mince pies here because, well, they got dropped off in my office and told I had to eat. They had to be eaten by July, so they're being eaten. Now, when I had six in this pack, I could pick the best one of what I fancied. When I only have two, I have a choice of A or B. Now, neither can be a particularly great mince pie, let's be honest. None of these have icing on the top. They aren't particularly deep-filled. 
neither is a particularly great example of a mince pie. But, I have to pick one, because I want to eat a mince pie. So I have to pick which one is that looks the tastiest right at this moment. Which one do I grab? And it's the same with the situation the German Navy's in. The Reichsmarine doesn't have many options. They don't have many officers with any experience. And he has experience. He's commanded in World War One. He was decorated for his operations in World War One. He knows what he's doing in command of light forces. There isn't any other option around. So they go and get here they give him a promotion to Vice Admiral. What's a mince pie? A uh, mince pie is a actually usually it's something served at Christmas in the UK. As I was saying, ah, on the spot observation, both Kaiser Wilhelm and Hitler were both afraid to lose ships, and their fear was a huge de uh, de uh, detriment for their fleet commanders, limiting their options and initiative. It was, but that's not the biggest problem for this uh, this one. They both also wanted to use their ships. They both had this idea they could win battles without losing ships. I still can't believe it. this is only... Uh, only two more lives after this before I go to um, Australia. And I, I'm going to say now there's not going to be a Discord tonight because I'm just too tired after the days, a previous few days wandering up and down the country. I haven't had much sleep and I do need at least some at some point. But saying that, there will be a Twitch stream tomorrow evening and there will be... I will try and do an appearance on Discord at some point this week so I can chat with you all before I go because I won't do one on next Thursday night either because I'll be getting up early in the morning to get to the airport because I have to go to Heathrow and fly to Australia. Uh, before any of you ask, yes, I am packing the bug spray. I just think it's sensible. Just, you just as as I understand it, what happens is you get off the plane in Australia, you hold the bug spray in front of you as you walk out the door of the plane, and you just start spraying. You don't care if there's people looking in front of you. You don't care if there's anyone breathing in front of you. You just keep spraying as you walk. And that's what I understand. I can't understand. It's something you said for having a tradition of success versus facing Navy that has that such a reputation. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Uh, lo he Longbow One Nightbot did not like the number of full stops he used. Heathrow's fun. Arrival not so much. Heathrow is Heathrow is interesting. Nightbot, I didn't realize you were actually awake. So, then we have Operation Versmung. Now, ah, oh, the interesting joys of life. Operation Versmung. It's it's worthwhile sort of thinking about, but it's also worthwhile considering what it actually is in this time's operation because. The thing is, Vice Admiral William Marshall, this gentleman, and Marshall is far more experienced in many ways than than Lutyens. He is. He is more experienced. He's commanded the Admiral Shear. He's commanded the Hessen. 
He commanded uh, various submarines in World War One. Um. He was a very experienced uh, part of the German Navy, and he had been, you know, he was in charge of the Neisenau when they, in November 1939, found the Royal Pindy while on patrol to Faroe Islands. It was Marshall who was in charge of the um, Neisenau and Scharnhorst at that point. So this is why I'm not mentioning, because some people, some someone actually said to me the other day when, when I was talking about this, uh, when they were looking through the recorded video for this one, you didn't mention the Royal Pindy, and I went, that's because Scharnhorst wasn't in, uh, that's because Lutyens wasn't in charge of the Knights and Iron Scharnhorst at that point. That was Marshall. So, he is an experienced Admiral. The thing is, Lutyens is supposed to be his deputy. Lutyens is supposed to be supporting him. He's supposed to be the second Vice Admiral on the operation. Now, unfortunately, Marshall falls ill. So, Lutyens gets command of the Narvik and Trondheim landings. Lutyens goes off to uh, goes off to Shanos and Nice now, and he puts his flag in latter. And one interesting thing is he starts to build up a really good rapport with the command with the captain of the Nice now. The Captain Neisner is his first flagship commander, as in proper flagship. Because let's be honest, he's been in light cruisers, which is good, but it's a bit cramped. Neisner and Scharnost are the proper, proper big ships the German Navy has at this point. They're the only big ships the German Navy has at this point. So, their captains are top, top notch. And they are building up a rapport. And yes, Lutyens is a young officer in terms of he's young in his experience of large ships. But he's got a good captain, and he's going to try his best. Now, interestingly, under his command are the forces of Frederick Bronte, who's in charge of the... Um, you know, the 10 destroyers going to Narvik. They're part of the force he's got under his command. So, the thing is, Lutyens has got a lot of the forces he's used to commanding under his command, but he's in direct command of two of the Germany's capital ships. There are only two capital ships. He was to cover the seizure of Narvik. He briefed his officers aboard Neisenau on the 6th of April in the presence of Admiral Le Raider. And this is important because Raider gets to see what kind of command Lutyens is going to be running. Now. Lutyens had already expressed to Raider his doubts about the entire operation. That's an important thing to say. He told Raider that he didn't think it was a good idea. He thought the invasion of Norway was setting them up to fail. They were going to be lost. However. However. He didn't, in front of Raider, explain this to say this to his subordinates. In fact, he was positive, upbeat, he tried to reassure them, he told them they would succeed. And he hoped for bad weather to shield this fleet from Allied aircraft. However, the skies turned out to be clear, um, and the ships were therefore attacked twice by the RAF, but they didn't achieve anything. Um... The British air crew, though, did also report their position, and so surprise was gone. Nevertheless, he remained on schedule. In fact, this is something which you have to understand. Lutyens was so preoccupied with remaining on schedule that the 
twi on two occasions during the voyage, they lost sailors overboard, and no rescue attempts were made. No account was there to be any interruption to the time schedule. So they lost two sailors. Now, the interesting point is, do you put this on the Admiral or the Captain? Because surely a man overboard is something which is brought to the Captain's attention, not the Admiral. Potentially. But the Admiral has emphasised keeping to the timetable, and so has the Captain has done so as well. Now, Lurchin's mission was to try to draw the Royal Navy away from Narvik and so to facilitate landings. And hopefully prevent the Royal Navy from attacking the destroyers and merchant vessels which are offloading supplies. Now, during this the landing phase, when his forces were both there, HMS Renown, of course, comes across them. Mm -hmm. Now, this is the important point. What I find interesting is there are various notes which read, uh, give this from the German perspective. And the German perspective on Renown coming across them is the British ship engaged at 0505 hours, and Lichens was forced to fight an inconclusive battle. Uh, very much an inconclusive battle. The action off Lofoten is what it's sometimes referred to. And you can go and find out its details. It's the 9th of April 1940. Um, Lutyens extracting the nice Nan Scharnhorst without incurring major battle damage, his view. Um, so he viewed his operation as a success. However, he had apparently considered fighting a pitched battle with with the renown, but he thought of two problems. One, he thought her destroyers were coming up, and frankly, he knew how dangerous destroyers were because he was a destroyer man, and he'd fought British destroyers in World War Two in World War One. He understood how good British destroyers were. He understood how good how good destroyers were. But two, there was something else. Something else was coming. Something else far scarier. Da 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 da. It is Rodney. Yes, he believed that Rodney was also coming up very quickly, and he felt that whilst Nisenau and Shanos could have fought and beaten Renown, they stood no chance against Rodney. None at all. And so, he left. Now, he decided that he'd considered fighting Renown, mainly because he thought that he might cause a diversion and stop, uh, buy his destroyer's time in Narvik to be refueled and escape. He thought if he fought Renown, he could buy time for the destroyers to escape. Now, we can also point out that there's not just Rodney. There's also war spite in those waters. There's all sorts of large British ships which were merrily hearing Renown going, I found my prey! Uh, no, I know. In broadcasting, of course, more simply, I found Sharnhorst and Eisenhower. Please come assist. Uh, not too soon. I'm winning. No, they didn't add a lot of it. Um, but he is extracting. Now, what I would also add that both battleships were damaged. Um, Ryzen Renown stuck, schnuck, uh, struck um, Nisenau first. Um, Nisenau scored two hits on Renown with her 11 inch shells. Both shells failed to explode. Uh, the first hit the foremast, the second passed through the ship near the steering gear room. And about the same time, uh, Renown actually struck Nisenau with two shells, and a third a little later. These managed to damage the German, uh, the Nisenau's director tower, forward ranging fighters, aft turret was put out of action, and the port anti aircraft gun was hit. Renown had then moved on to fire under Scharnhorst, uh, which moved to try and protect Nisenau with smoke, and. Well, Renown managed to keep up the firing. Both had their elect their electrical problems in their turrets as a result of the firing, and this basically stopped their guns firing on both battleships at one point. So both Sharnos and Eisenau were knocked had their turrets knocked out at various points by Renown's firing. Um, 
Renown managed to damage her starboard bulge in the rough seas and thanks to the firing of guns, which actually reduced her speed, which is how they got away. <sighs> yeah, and so the, the engagement only lasted 20 minutes due to the waves, thanks to the damage to the... Um, Thanks to the damage to the bulge, the wave started to break over the Renown's forward turrets as the German ships headed directly into a storm to escape. Um, after the action, it was found that Neisenau had a turret which was completely offline and required a dockyard to assist to fix it. Scharnhorst's radar was out of action. And yeah, they were having fun. Renown fired 230 15-inch and 1,065 4.5-inch rounds during the action, uh, while Scharnhorst fired 182 11-inch rounds, and Neisenau only fired 54 11-inch rounds. Now, if we put in context, the 6-gun ship managed to fire 230 rough salvo, uh, uh, shells over the action. So, six guns, 230 divided by six guns. The Shan Horse fired 182, so that's basically 20 salvos. The Renown fired, if you divide it by six, you're, you're probably in roughly getting up to 38 salvos. And Nisenau fired only 54, so she fired about six salvos. So, think about that. Nisenau fired six salvos, roughly. Scharnhorst fired 20 salvos, roughly. Renown fired 48, uh, no, 38 salvos. Um, no, so is it a reasonable answer to the situation that uh, that uh, Sharnos Nice now wouldn't have been able to survive an encounter with Romney? They, let's be honest, Nice now almost has a close in has a close encounter with Romney and almost gets buried by it. Um, that's during Operation Berlin. If she hadn't, if uh, it's basically it's a few minutes and it's a few rounds. If anything, either way, if uh, Nice now had been slightly slower, realizing that. Rodney was coming, there probably would have been the damage and Rodney would probably have won that fight. Rodney, in, if Sharnhorst and Nice now are made to go slow enough that they are engaged, they cannot run away from Rodney, Rodney takes them out. There is no doubt in my mind that Rodney wins that fight every single time. Especially if she has renown there. Let's be honest, if you have Atreus Renown, add Rodney, and then Sharnos and Nice now can't escape because they can't use their speed advantage over Rodney to escape, they are basically fighting a floating lump of metal with guns on top. John Sams, would Renown be firing broadsides or double salvos? Double salvo being two half salvos between corrections. Probably uh, firing double salvos. It, that seems to be what the uh, what Renown was firing. So that's, uh, you know, I gave the estimate in what was equivalent of full salvo equivalents, but let's be honest, she's probably firing free, then firing free. So you're probably actually dealing with somewhere in the region of 38... You could be dealing with what would actually be basically 70, ooh, 76 half salvos. Um, you would think, Dan, she was firing mostly her forward pair of turrets, but her aft turret does seem to be getting through quite a lot of shots. So, yeah. Forward turret's probably most of it, but yeah. But that then gets things more interesting because it's six versus um, three, and let's well, it's no, let's be honest, it's four, it's four versus 
And the thing is, again, if you're chasing two ships, they have more space to turn their angle angle their guns. So um, it can be fun. But yeah, it's four guns versus six, and she still fires a lot more. But no, most ships, uh, they did actually were firing their forward guns, managing to get into the plane, so they had... The, they had that position to fire their after gun, uh, their forward guns to fire them to the stern, and yeah, with renown, she did manage to get her after turret to bear as well as a couple of times. Because you have to remember, ships aren't trying to close often to get to this point, so they're right, they're, they're sort of right close. They're sort of closing so they can get to a, a gunnery region, so they often close at an angle, and that allows you to bring your other guns to bear. Anyway, after that little battle, of course, well, he got him, got them home, and he knew that by heading home, he was abandoning his the ships. He was abandoning the destroyers, the force he'd helped build up. Remember, this is the man who's built the German destroyer force, and he soon learns that Bonte was killed when the Wilhelm Heidkamp was exploded. And Bonte had been one of the officers he'd chosen and trained. And so he deserted the force he'd trained. He'd had to to save this, these larger ships. Now. Raider endorsed his actions. And more importantly, he was doing what he was supposed to have done. He was doing what he needed to do. But we do know that his decision and the abandonment of Bront uh, Bonte's destroyer group, Narvik, was not something he took lightly and did have an impact on him. Well, that's almost what happens to Neisenau later on. I'll be talking about it in Operation Berlin, but Neisenau almost has a has a scenario where it's at low speed, a very low speed, basically um, tootling around a merchant ship that it's pretty much capturing and looting. And Rodney comes over the horizon going at full speed plus. I Its official speed is 23 knots. It was not doing 23 knots. It was doing more. Uh, uh, Captain Dalrymple, uh, Dalrymple Hamilton was in charge, and Dalrymple Hamilton goes, I want speed! He does everything apart from re uh, paint red go faster stripes on the side, and probably would have done if he thought it would work. And, well, they come very close. But that's later on. That's Operation Berlin. Marshall took over command after he left. After he got back. He got back and instead of being thrown back into operations... He's sent ashore because Marshall's back well, so you, Marshall goes out to command his fleet because he's the proper commander. And what does Marshall do? Well, Marshall goes and attacks HMS Glorious. Rather like he attacked, you know, uh, the Royal of Pindy earlier on in the war. And it's not considered of value. Uh, to put the sort of the phraseology in the discussions between Raider and Lutyens was that... Whilst the sinking would was a great public uh, was public a great publicity, it was target practice, and a damage to Scharnhorst and consequently to Neisenau because Scharnhorst damage meant the Neisenau had to be out on operation, and then I'll get through that one, offset the victory because the thing is the Royal Navy has lots of aircraft carriers, 
the German Navy only has Scharnhorst and Neisenau. You have to remember this. They don't have any other things available. They only have Scharnhorst and Neisenau. And an HT 7040, I can't believe how many short shots King George V got off. We haven't got onto King George V yet. We've been talking about re uh, renown so far. Anyway, but that's later. So, he gets command. And the first operation he gets the command, well, as is mentioned, Sharnhorst had got damaged in the operation against Glorious. He got damaged by a torpedo from... Uh, from a caster and ardent. One of their torpedoes had heavily damaged her. So, Lutchen's first post, when he's given command of the fleet, and he's made fleet commander, is to get Scharnhorst back to Germany to be repaired. And so, with the phraseology of Raider, he'd had experience of staff war work, and as my chief personnel had won my, my special confidence in years of close association, he was a sound technician, an excellent staff officer, and had all important operational and battle experience, i.e. very few officers ticked those boxes. But most importantly, Lutchens displayed wise judgment and was unlikely to act rashly. Hitler even sent his expression of gratitude to Lutyens for preparing and leading the Navy into action and awarded him a Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross on 14th of June 1940. Scharnhorst was sitting in Trondheim at this point and had been taking emergency repairs. Flying his flag once again in Neisenau with the excellent flag captain from before, Lutyens took command of his first voyage. On the 20th of June 1940, in company with the Admiral Hipper, he went to the North Sea in hope of diverting attention from the Scharnhorst. Uh, this succeeded. Unfortunately, Neisenau herself was torpedoed by HMS Clyde and severely damaged. Yes, HMS Clyde, a river class Royal Navy submarine. Uh, very interesting little vessel, launched in 1930, March 1934, was one of the few vessels which would serve as a submarine throughout the entirety of World War II, spending a large chunk of it in both the Scandinavian and Mediterranean waters. Um, she even managed to go and take out some, uh, some Japanese vessels. HMS Clyde is probably one of those submarines you really want to look out for in the Royal Navy because... She seems to manage to go everywhere and take out everything. In fact, if the Royal Navy wants to name a submarine, uh, not wants to name any vessel after what is arguably one of the most dangerous submarines they ever ser had served, they should call it HMS Clyde. But of course, currently HMS Clyde is a river class patrol vessel, and that was transferred in decommissioned 2020 and transferred to Bahrain. So we currently do not have an HMS Clyde in service with the Royal Navy. Blackburn Maxwell, if the Nelson's got a refit just before the war and the Iron got a license produced for the full circulation boilers of Rickling, how fast could it be to go? Well, that's an interesting thing because really the problem with the Nelsons and their speed is not their power plants, although you could have, uh, putting in more boilers wouldn't hurt. It's their number of shafts. The, the Nelsons, are Nelrods, are the only two, only battleships the Royal Navy has in this period which are two shafts. So they've only got two shafts to deploy that power through. If you add in a added in a third shaft and the appropriate engines, which wouldn't have taken that much extra weight when they've been built, you'd probably be talking 28, 30 knot, uh, 28 to 29 knot, probably, maybe even 30 knot vessels.
Goron, there was a large ship that could have supported the Serling uh, uh, Arahua. Yeah, pretty much. Basically, it's the only ships they've got are Nice and Arahua uh, and Hippo. It with this is the point that was made to Marshall that he didn't seem to understand it, but Lutrans did. We only have two capital ships. One gets damaged. We only have one. So therefore, we have to use a heavy cruiser as the backup. But we've only got a certain number of those. And by the way, oh, think about it. At this point, they've lost the Graf Spey. So they've lost one of their free Deutschland class. Deutschland is being renamed the Lutzow as we speak and going through all sorts of fun for that one. And now they've had Scharnhorst damaged. And then they get Neisenau damaged while looking after Scharnhorst. And basically, this means he can't do anything for quite a while. So um, he goes off and takes out, helps out with the planning of Operation Sea Lion. I'm going to have to talk about Operation Sea Lion. I'm going to have to get another iron brew. Oh, where's my mince pies gone? Yeah. Iron brew. Must reach iron brew. Found the iron brew. We have the brew. So, Operation Sea Lion. Um, so, he managed to avoid Rodney, though, which is always a good thing. Avoiding Rodney is basically the best thing he can do for him, because he does seem to have a premonition that if ever he gets close to Rodney, things aren't going to go well. Now... One of the first orders of business, before they'd even really na nailed down a plan, was to try and scour the Nazi-occupied territory for roughly 1,800 river barges, roughly 1,800, 500 tugs, 150 steamships, and 1,200 motorboats. Now, that's what they thought they needed to get, uh, their, uh, get two armies, the 9th and the 6th army, I think, from memory. Um... Yeah, the ninth and the sixth army, I think. Uh, across the channel. The eighteenth army would follow later. Oh, the ninth and the sixteenth, sorry. It's going the ninth and the sixth, and it's the sixteenth, I do apologize. Um, the idea was basically to do an extended version of the Normandy invasion, Norman invasion of England, because basically, um, the Germans looked back and decided they would go for the using as their template the last successful invasion, last successful invasion of the United Kingdom. So they decided, let's land at between Hastings and Worthing and deal to Hastings. Now. I would like to point this out. There are many fine beaches in those areas. There are many fine beaches. None of them, and I repeat this, none of them are beach. Uh, none of them are exactly unpredictable, and quite a lot of them are frankly a small nightmare to get to. Furthermore, I would add. And this is an important one. <sighs> Quite a lot of those beaches have very interesting areas behind them. The example I would give is where? Let's go let's go with Worthing, right? Now, Worthing Beach is something I have some experience of we're going to. And I love it dearly. I do. There is this wonderful cafe on it. Called the Sea Lane Cafe. And you cannot overstate how nice it is to sit on a summer's day on that cafe looking over the waves. It really is. It really can be not know it's said to be so nice. But it's a shingle bit, a shingle mound, sand and then shingle. And then you come up onto a sort of rise. 
And then the bank goes down behind it, and you go down into the dip, and then you're into an urban area for quite a lot a section of it. In other words, it makes the bocage look like an easy area to def like a difficult area to defend, and an easy area to attack. Worthing is not this idea of this wonderful beach. People look at it and go, oh, you could invade so easily. No. No, Worthing Beach is not good. There are various tidal flows. There is all sorts of shallowish water bits. And frankly, getting your ships in to provide fire support is going to be fun. Basically, it's a small nightmare. And don't worry, Lurchens has some brilliant ideas. Brilliant idea. Take the pre-dreadnoughts and sink them in the channel. And if you sink them in the channel, they will block the Royal Navy getting in to attack the other uh, fleet crossing. So. Um... Could a Norman invasion succeed if Nelson, Rondi, and 50 destroyers were in their way? No, it couldn't have. Let's be honest, it would not be just Nelson, Rondi. It's it's that... that I, Mr. I sense a killing zone with Worthing Beach. Yes! Yes, a killing zone is one way to describe it. Um, Dan Freeman, don't worry. The defense have been prepared near Worthing since, well, there's an Iron Age hill fort. There is an, uh, there's a lovely Iron Age hill fort not far away from it. There's, basically, it's not a nice place to attack. And remember, he's attacking directly into the area where Montgomery thinks he's going to attack. And Montgomery's in charge of organizing defenses. And whilst I would agree that the one person, uh, uh, General, who I consistently find slightly more annoying sometimes is Montgomery, uh, than MacArthur is Montgomery, and that's mainly because Montgomery doesn't need to be quite so pushy on the personality media front and the stuff he tries to do. He's actually a good general. He doesn't need that stuff and that persona. He could do it without it. Whereas MacArthur needs that persona, because that's pretty much all he's got. And this is a problem, because if you're going to land here, you're going to land straight into the defensive zone, and you've got a choice. If you're lucky, you're going to be faced by regular British troops who remember the Geneva Convention, or at least have a vague concept of its existing, and understand it may apply to them. If you're unlucky, you're going to face the Home Guard, who, remember, are mostly World War I veterans, who don't really like Germans for the first place. Secondly, uh, because of World War I, are not really that keen on... Well, they, uh, from their experiences of World War I, have mostly left with various forms of PTSD, which they now fear is going to be visited on their families who they kept they were left behind and protected from World War I, who you're now going to come and see them, and who have who spent several years fighting a very solid defensive war on in the trenches, knowing defensive warfare like the back of their hands, and in territory they know like the back of their hands, and who have been told that by the British government, we don't have enough weapons, so you're going to have to get innovative. So let's be honest. They did get very innovative. Very, very innovative. In fact, there are even very solid British uh, British regular officers of the Royal Navy and the Army are pro regularly playing with various um, ho uh, various uh, home guard suggestions. Um, can we please, pretty, pretty, please, pretty, pretty, please find a way to say no to this idea? Because, frankly, it's scaring us, let alone the enemy. The thing is, NHT7040, the, the point that I often make is Captain Mannering and the home uh, and sort of that particular program, it's a lovely program and I love it, it's very funny. But then you look at the reality of the Comb Guard. So let's put it this way. 
the most of the men are in their they were in their 20s in World War One. This is now 20 odd years later, so they're in their late 40s. So they're not overweight. Uh, they're not sort of ter they're not sort of terribly unfit. They're over 40s. Many of them have been working manual labour jobs most of their life, or especially in the countryside areas, they'll be farmers. They'll be la they'll be farm labourers. They'll be all sorts of people. They'll be used to a rigorous lifestyle. They'll have kept shooting. They'll know their area off by hand. And you think about this one, okay? This is the point I make. Imagine this. You're a veteran of World War I. You're a grandfather. Your son is off serving in the forces who knows where. You have living with you your daughter-in-law, your wife, and your grandchildren, perhaps. Maybe multiple of your daughters-in-law and, uh, you know, and grandchildren have come to stay with you because they've come from the city to be safe from the bombs. And you're now told that the Germans are going to invade. And let's say the Germans do invade. And your, your thing going through your mind is you have to buy time for your wife, your daughters-in-law, your grandchildren to get to safety. That's your mission. To buy time. Now you tell me, is that someone you want to try and fight? Because that person is not going to care if you wound them. The only way you're going to stop them is if you take them out completely. And there's going to be an entire platoon, company strength formation of them, holding land they've lived in their entire lives. Armed to the teeth of whatever they've got. Putting in whatever traps they want, they've thought of in place. Creating whatever defensive positions they can think of in place. And they've had time to prepare it. Imagine trying to take on that. Yes, they make a joke of it with Captain Mannering and that. And it's good they do. It's nice to think about it lightheartedly. But in all seriousness, that is not a formation that anyone sensible wants to try and fight. Because those men would not have given an inch. They would not have backed down one centimetre. They would have not have left one iota of pit of land... Until they absolutely had to. Until their families were safe. And even then, the odds are you won't get them to move. So your only job is going to be getting through all these little winding roads and little valleys and little sort of bridges and all the places you have in that area in that period is going to be fighting your way through them. And while you're doing that, while you're sat having your strength sat fighting through these home guard units, the regular army coming in and reinforcing them when it can and trying to find a heavy fiber, you're going to have the Royal Navy doing a battle ride straight down into the channel. Disregarding any losses, disregarding any, any attacks, getting to your forces to take them out. That's not a scenario uh, that's not a scenario the German army comes back from. Marga, has anyone ever made a, some kind of list of Book of the Home Guard's scary ideas? Sounds like it would be a fascinating read. It would be. Um, me and Drac have considered writing such a book. We haven't managed. We haven't found anyone else who's written such a book, but we have considered writing it. Um, I, I frankly think um, the uh, gentleman who wrote Mud, Blood, and Poppycock should write it. But you know, I'm not sure if Gordon Corrigan has it. Has done so. But uh, Mud, Blood and Pocky, uh, Poppycock by Gordon Corrigan is an absolute must-read for the First World War. And frankly, if anyone could do justice to the Home Guard and the reality of it, it would be him.
That was actually, I presume that out of all the German forces, the Kriegsmarine actually understood the need to resupply from time to time. They did worry about it. Like my Maximus, basically, what happened to Soviets during the invasion of Finland during the Winter War? Only with less snow and more sheep. Uh, yes, but most of those areas are actually more dairy farms. Razorowski, if they were smart, the iron would have made the null rods a free shaft and even made the turret armor thinner and ready to be replaced with proper thickness to armor during war, or made belt thinner and swap plates in war for normal armor. Mm, honestly, considering they got the null rods in at... Um, they displaced 33,800 uh, 3, tons standard. Remember, their maximum is 35,000 tons. So, I think with a further 1,200 tons, they could have fitted in the shaft. I think with 1,200 tons, if you built them to 35,000 tons standard, you could have built, you could have added in that third shaft. Um... I would certainly say the burning oil has got to be one of the top ones, but... Look, they they had ideas of they were digging mines. I know I know there were some units which were digging mines like they dug in World War One and were literally packing hills of explosives. And their entire idea was they would fight the Germans all the way up the hill, G not giving ground, fighting them the whole way up, saying that making the Germans really fight to take a hill, and then once the Germans were on top of the hill, blowing the entire hill to smithereens. They had all sorts of very nasty plans. Number one, I live down here in Kent. We still see the defences that were built. Yep. Drones, how long before the British destroyers actually run straight into the French ports, hot the whole loading the front of the second wave? Uh, depends how many tribal class destroyers get survive getting the capital ships down to the actual the, the wars other than the actual battle. Where should they have landed? Um, honestly, there's nowhere which is that good. I, I would say that probably their best advantage would be to try and use the, the try and land in the Thames Estuary area and work their way up London using the Thames River as their um, logistic supply route. But that just leaves them too open to attack from the Royal Navy. So there's no good area for them to really invade. German, they need a larger fleet if they want to cover invasion. Run by one. If they had landed along the Romney, they would have had to deal with a miniature armoured train armed with Lewis guns. Yes, that would have been really quite disturbing. <laughs> then, what's do we know if Britain was able to make burning oil work? I know the Germans tried to make it work, but couldn't get a, a, a thick enough layer to burn well. Oh no, the British got it working. They They actually filmed tested it and worked it working. They actually <clears throat> set up some installations of it. Um, it was it was not good. Let's, let's put it this way. There, there were many, many very, very nasty ideas the Home Guard came up with. And, some, uh, and uh, the fact is, most of the time, the um, army ended up going along the lines of, we can't stop you doing this. So we'll just let you do it and put a note on our plan that we're going nowhere near there, okay? We'll leave that area to you to defend. And the home guard was sort of going, Thank you. That will be our hill. <sighs> so now we have Operation Berlin. And Operation Berlin is another fun one for the uh, for them. Really, it is fun. Yeah, exactly. The, I know the miniature armored train did exist. It, it sh managed to shoot down a BF one hundred and nine. Yes, I know. I've be. If you ever go to the Rom, uh, 
Romney Dimchurch and Hi uh, Romney Hive and Dimchurch Railway, which is the uh, the little sort of railway we're talking about, you can ride on the train, and you can actually ride still ride behind a locomotive which was converted into an armoured train, from memory, and it's a really fun ride. I, I recommend it as a railway to go and see. North Norfolk at Duke of Edgington was not any better an idea to land. Trust me. I was like, the Germans had ideas about landing, and Germans had ideas about landing in Scotland from Norway. All I can tell you is my family was sharpening a lot of instruments in that period. Um, instruments and implements. There were lots of interesting auxiliaries. You have to remember, SOE's original foundations were not in a force for going to the continent. They were a force which was supposed to provide, the Special Operations Executive was supposed to provide these people who would stay behind enemy lines. As the Germans rolled over, they'd wait a day for the German major units to get past, etc. Or, you know, get start, and then start causing trouble behind enemy lines. And that was their plans. And then once the scare of fear invasion went over, they went... We now have all these people who have all these skills who are really useful. Oh, let's send them to France. As I just mentioned, Jeff Brown. But as said, it won't be the Home Guard that be pushed back. The British Army might be pushed back, but the Home Guard wouldn't be. The Home Guard, I honestly believe, the only way many of them you would have had to... The only way you would have managed to move through Home Guard areas is if you'd killed the Home Guard. Because they would not stop fighting till they ran out of ammunition or died. And I have a feeling if they died, then you'd be dealing with some very nasty close quarters fighting. And remember, again, these were men who'd survived the trenches. If they've survived the trenches of World War One. Imagine some of the horrible things they've had to do and been and done and seen done and have been taught, and imagine what they'll do in close quarters. Remember, if you guys want to know how bad these guys are, they had restarted World War One Mark IV tank impulsive. Yeah. They had a few of those running around. They'd been quite a feature of most villages for many years. A, a, a World War One tank. They got quite a lot of them running. And there was also a few tractors which were converted into various versions of armoured vehicles. And they had all sorts of ideas. Do you imagine North Norfolk's beaches are perfect landing? There are no natural barriers. No, there are natural barriers. You just don't see them from North Norfolk, uh, from the beaches. The beaches look like a, a lovely area to land. The trouble is, once you go in, there are barriers. And once you're out at sea, there are barriers. There is the way the actual beaches are formed beyond North Norfolk. The actual water and the currents and the tides... That's going to make landing in North Norfolk fun. And marshes, well, let you also have to remember the other thing about Norfolk is that most of its marshes are as limited as they are because it's drained. If you stop draining the marshes, it turns into a quagmire pretty darn quickly. Anyway. That's off tonight's topic. Tonight's topic is, of course, is L Lutyens and Operation Berlin was his next one. So finally, when the air battle over Britain is lost and, you know, even 
Goering is having to admit that, frankly, he can't win control of the air, which, luckily, the uh, right uh, Kriegsmarine had said was a m absolute necessity for them to be able to do anything. They decided to go, right then. Let's do something else. And thankfully, by this point, Sean Orson and I know were ready for an action. And so their task was to go out and take part in the Battle Atlantic. On the 28th of December 1940, Scharnhorst and Neisenau, once again having looked the board, left Germany for their Atlantic raid. Now, due to weather, Lutschens is ordered to return to port, so Neisenau goes to Kiel and Scharnhorst to Gidinia. And they carried out some more repairs on them. While they were having these, report, uh, these, uh, these repairs carried out, Navy Group West i.e. the staff and the commander of Navy Group West, really did emphasize, and that's, I think, Rolf Karls at this point, that the primary targets were enemy merchant vessels. Lutchens, therefore, reiterated his standing orders to his captains. Our job is to put as many as possible under the water. Now, Remember, his task is to go out and fight and destroy merchant ships without, without getting sunk himself. And so he's got to avoid contact. And this is where our lovely HMS Ramleys comes in. Isn't she pretty? Look, look at her. Isn't she lovely? She's an R-Class battleship from World War One. She's not really been upgraded that much at all, but... She's pretty in her own way because she's going to prove very useful in a short amount of time. That's good. Remember, the sea lion was relying on unpad but river barges for about fifty percent of their transport capacity. North Norfolk coast is a bad place to be without an engine. It's an awful place to be without an engine. It is an absolutely terrible place to be without an engine. Um. Yeah. There are all sorts of issues with Norfolk. North Norfolk looks good right up until you start looking deeper at the details. And you start going, hang on, but they can do this. And hang on, they can do that. And hang on, there is this. And everything starts adding up and you're going, oh, that's really not a good idea to land there. No, it isn't. There are issues. Anyway. So, they go out again. This time, it's the 22nd of January, 1941. And, Lutchens chooses to pass between the Iceland, Iceland and the Faroe Islands. Now, unbeknown to him, he'd actually been spotted already. British agents had spotted him and reported it to their high command. However, John Tovey, the commander-in-chief of the home fleet, um, when alerted, dispatched three battleships, eight cruisers, eleven destroyers to hunt for them, aiming to intercept the Germans off southern Iceland. Now, think about that. There are three battleships. There are eight cruisers and eleven destroyers coming out to hunt two German Battleships. Imagine if they'd actually managed the hit. Imagine more if they'd have been able to have aircraft carriers with them because the Royal Navy hadn't been short because they hadn't lost Courageous and Glorious. So you see, there is a knock-on effect. So if Glorious hadn't been sunk by Sean Austin and Eisenhower earlier, which damaged them and stopped them being able to use earlier in the war... Uh, because they've been out of action for a few months, then the British might have had an aircraft carrier here, which might have resulted in the Machi getting sunk. 
So, th this is the scenario going on. This is the thing. There, if, the, if you have an extra aircraft carrying the Royal Navy at this point, you have more issues. Now, they were briefly sighted by the Naid, which is, of course, a Dido class destroyer, a Dido class cruiser. As you know, I'd like to refer to them as <coughs> destroyer built cruisers rather than cruiser built destroyers. And um, because of the way their guns are packed in them. But I quite like Naid. I have named a Shikar after in the past. And she sighted the German, the, the Shan Horse and Eisenhower on the 20th of January. As Luchens was preparing to break through the Eisen Ferro gap, a gap. And reported their position. But Luchens then retired northward with the intention of passing through the Denmark Straits. The Denmark Straits is a favourite passage of Luchens. It is favoured route. And, well, he goes and tanks there. Now, while he's doing this, Tovey starts to disbelieve they're out. He, does, he thinks they've gone back. He thinks they've managed to... Escape, they've, they've gone away. They've given up. Now... On the 30th of January, Luchens decided to refuel from the Fawn off Jan, Jan Mayan Island before attempting his breakout route through the Denmark Straits. He, on the 4th of February, he slips into the Atlantic. Now, please note, the reason Tovey gave for dismissing the spotting by Naid was that he felt it must have been an illusion. He felt a captain... Several spotters and all the per and lots of personnel aboard Naid had been confused by a group illusion that there were two battleships in front of them. Damn it, I will say that name very differently to you, Alex. Naid. Hmm. Anyway. This meant Luchens had what we could often qualify as the operational initiative. He could choose between two potential zones of attack. Now he had as his options the northern route or the southern convoy route to go after. Small problem. He doesn't realise the northern route comes with added ramilies because the Royal Navy has these. Escorting them. He knows the northern route has the bigger, more vital convoys though. And his intelligence had told them that Ramleys and Revenge are based at Halifax, Nova Scotia, where we say, where HMCS Sackville now lives. And, more importantly, they had told them that they could only escort convoys out a thousand miles east of their base. And so as long as he kept beyond a thousand miles east of, of Halifax, Nova Scotia, he was safe from Ramleys and Revenge. Now, this is a small issue. Because whilst he's right, these are the bigger convoys. And whilst on the 8th of February, he gets an alert from German intelligence that HX-106 had sailed from Halifax, Nova Scotia. On the 31st of January. So they were going to be a perfect target for him to get. What he didn't realise was that Ramillies and Revenge had no understanding of why they were apparently limited to just escorting the convoys a thousand nautical miles. Remember. The Revenge class had a theoretical range of 7,000 nautical miles at 10 knots. Now, that's a theoretical range of 7,000 nautical miles at 10 knots. Most convoys, at this point, were steaming at roughly 12 knots. But also, it was found amazingly, again, with quite a lot of British battleships, that um, 
for some reason, they, they, they seem to be able to take more fuel than, A, their standard displacement claimed. And, um, B, it seems that there were various interesting things about their engines had been upgraded at certain points. And um, what he instead finds when he goes and attacks this convoy, goes to attack the convoy, he find he decides to plan a pincer movement with the vessels, the Sharnos and Eisenhower, now coming from the north and the south. Nice position to do so. And what he finds is sitting in the middle of the convoy, going "Hello, hello, I'm here to say hello." Who was HMS Ramleys? Now. Here is the thing. You can do the wargaming, and I'm fairly sure if we run it through on UAD, and I probably will tomorrow evening on UAD if you want me to, a HMS Ramley-style 15-inch battleship escorting a convoy cannot win a battle against two, uh, two uh, Deutschen class, uh, two Scharnhorst class battleships. It's probably going to lose that battle. However, it's probably also going to do sufficient damage, and I mean this, sufficient damage, that one or more of those ships is not going to be able to get to its full speed. And that means that we combined with all the radio signals that will be going out, if you imagine it, Toby's force, he might go, well, I don't believe Naid. I don't believe Naid. But when he hears from Ramillies that she is fighting such a scenario, and all the convoys sending off messages saying they are fighting such a scenario, he's going to come charging across. And he'll find your two damaged, or maybe one, dam uh, one heavily damaged and one not damaged battleships, and you'll be fighting three modern ships. And remember, he's got the only two capital ships in the German Navy. The only two that are working. So... He decides he doesn't want to fight that battle. Um, at one point, Captain Hoffman of the Scharnhorst, who had been a former pupil of his, uh, he'd been one of the officers he'd trained up in the German Navy, seemed to be not following his orders, as he was as Scharnhorst was attempting to try and draw off Ramillies. But... That forgets one small issue. Ramley's job is not to go and hunt down German fast battleships. In fact, it knows it can't go and hunt German fast battleships. It knows what it is. Its job is to secure the convoy. So what it's going to do is sit with the convoy. That's all it's going to do. Sit with the convoy. And wait for you to come to it. Now, the thing is, what I would say is interesting is Hoffman and Lutyens have a disagreement over, Ho o o over Hoffman's intentions. And they actually have arguments over the radio. Pretty much. But they managed to sort it out. And they managed to still have a good relationship. So what I would like to point out is what you might be noticing is that whilst Lutyens is not necessarily the most experienced battle fleet, battle fleet commander and is not necessarily the most experienced, um, most open and gregarious officer. He doesn't have a default of having bad relationship, uh, relationships with other officers or his subordinates. He tends to actually have a quite a good relationship with other officers and subordinates because if you think about it, he's used to going having dinners with ones and twos. So when you're actually an admiral, going having a dinner with your captains, it is only going to be a couple of people. Dan Rune, oh, do we really think Sharnos knows are going to do well after their performance of their shells against Renown? Um, hopefully their, shell, their shells by this point have been improved a bit and were a bit better. So, you know, hopefully they would do. So just checking on the San Diego position. A ship that can cross the Atlantic to base at Halifax, it can't cross the Atlantic to escort a convoy. No, uh, that the German idea was that they would have to stay in Halifax 
because what they forgot was they hand over at the halfway point to another ship, another, uh, basically what happens is you have two convoys crossing, and what happens is the battleships get to about the midway point, turn around and go back with the other convoys. So the convoy, the battleship which is based in Halifax, will be the one which will take it from Halifax, uh, Halifax to the centre point, and then will take up the new uh, the convoy from the UK back to Halifax. And the convoy, which and that's, well, that's how they were sort of running it. That's how they were sort of running, with the important slower convoys. Zachary Gerken, British battleship designers, quietly whistling, pretending they have no idea what just keeps happening. Yeah. Darren, no doubt the Lushans and the other country were talking full power areas. Yes, they were. Um, still, uh, because the Royal Navy had, because Ramley had only sighted one ship, and Hipper was known to be at sea, Tovey again presumes that uh, this is just Hipper. This is just the Admiral Hipper. This is not Scharnhorst and Eisenau. And it's just Hipper talking with a perhaps another raider. Toby believing, despite RAF suggestions to the contrary from RAF reconnaissance aircraft, uh, that they were still in German ports. There were quite a few other officers in the Admiralty looking at Toby at this point and going, are you quite sure you're all right? Because seriously, everyone's giving you all this information and you're still claiming they're not out there. It is exactly, you just said, uh, looks like an overgrown carpenter's pencil. You are exactly right. It is a carpenter's pencil I need to sharpen. <laughs> not, to, not to mention the fact that there's probably going to be a few tribal class destroyers, their crews salvating for a fight like the human pit bulls they are, and they just heard Ramlis has been sunk. Yeah, there's, that, that's, a, that's just a continual concern for the German Navy. Now, so they rendezvoused roughly somewhere between Iceland and Canada with the tankers SO Hamburg and Schleichstadt on the 15th of February. And one of the things you have to remember is slowly the British start working down the German tankers and supply ships. So this is another thing which happens during Operation Berlin and other operations. Slowly the British start taking down those ships and getting those ships thanks to intelligence operations, thanks to their own ship presence, etc. And this stops the Germans being able to do these operations like this. <laughs> And then they picked up a five cargo um, empty ship, uh, empty ships from a westbound convoy sailing without escort towards American ports. Now, at this point, the battleships closed. They sunk four, and while the hulls then managed to temporarily evade them. Um, Lutchen's actually sent off one of his scout search aircraft to try and locate it. The Ardo pilot reported to have found it, claimed to have destroyed the aerial, but had taken damage from return fire, and so its position was then known by that point, but the, the German ships actually closed and sunk the hulls in at 2300 hours. So on the 22nd of February, they had managed to, ca to kill 25,000 tons of British shipping in one day. Unfortunately, their expenditure of ammunition had been expensive and it had been at long range, so they'd used their 11-inch ammunition. This is not good because he cannot replace this at sea. There aren't a lot of supplies for it going around. And this meant the Lutchens used the radio for his first time since the 8th of February, i.e. the day when he'd been telling Scharnhorst to frantically not engage the Ramillies. And got the supply, uh, got the SO Hamburg and Schleichstadt to meet him near the Azores so he could replenish his stocks again. 26 February, he unloads roughly 180 prisoners of war onto the Ermland and Frederick Breen. And then, they act uh, and then on the, you know, as on the 22nd of February, uh, that, that day, which I presume, only 11 as Allied sailors had been casualties. So, you know. He managed to, out of 191 sailors, he'd captured 180 and killed 11. 
At this point, he realizes that actually the northern area was not that good, and so he goes south. See? He goes south. Look at that. And look at that lovely map. You know, that shows the Admiral Shears route. That shows uh, the Grass Bay. And it shows um, the uh, Sean Olsen Nisenau's route in black. You can see what they're doing. Now, on the 5th of March, he sent off his aircraft again. But it, and they only actually found, they actually ended up having to go and recover the aircraft because it ran out of fuel. But luckily, the aircraft had flown over a German submarine. And it had therefore been, presumed it that large ships were close to position. It sent a message to Germany. And this alerted, uh, this had told, uh, this told him that there was a convoy. And so he went and supported the submarine. However, do you know what was escorting this convoy? This was SL-67. They found another convoy. This had HMS Malaya with it. So, once again, he couldn't attack. But what he did do was he shadowed the convoy and directed in U-124 and U-105 onto the convoy. So he helped the German submarines pick out their targets. However, um, it became a very narrow scenario with Malaya because it turned out that she could go faster than she was supposed to because at one point she pulses ahead from the convoy and he almost gets caught by her. They realise they're in very close range to Malaya. They have a almost a significant Malaya event. They really do. Again, Longbow, what have you done to trigger Nightbot? <sighs> anyway. They managed to sink a um, another. They managed to sink a Greek, a Greek ship on the next day, and that was carrying roughly seven thousand tons of coal to Alexandria. So that would have been kind of useful. Anyway, on the eleventh of March, he receives a message from Group West. Admiral Scheer and Hipper were to operate north, and um, German intelligence had alerted to the possibility of a British force. Consisting apparently of the British Mediterranean fleet, which were on a westerly course from Gibraltar. Okay, so apparently he'd done so much damage, the British Mediterranean fleet were going to come out of the Mediterranean to come and beat him up. Let's all th think for a moment as to whether or not that was a likely reality. Let's all consider German intelligence thinking that this was a likely outcome. If we don't think it was, the odds are it wasn't. Now, at this point, he decides that his that he needs to attract attention to allow the sheer strafe passage through the Denmark Strait. And so he decides that the best way to attract such attention is to head for France via the HX convoy route. Now, here comes some more problems. Because there is something coming for him, but it is not, and I repeat, it is not the British Mediterranean Fleet. He sailed up for the cut for the Bay of Biscay. And well he managed to intercept the uh, Polycarb and the San Carasmi uh, Car uh, Casimiro. And he managed to capture the ships, put prize crews in their order to go to Bordeaux. The Polycarb made it. The other merchant vessels, which he'd sent out, and he, he captured another couple of ones uh, from a convoy, They the German crews decided to scuttle them. Why? HMS Renown. Yes, yeah, she's come back for round two. She's trying to find him. Later, then, so the supply ships, Uckermark and Emrand, uh, signaled they'd sighted another convoy. And they acted as shepherds. They rushed at the staff of the merchant ships and drove them towards the German battleships. 
And so on the 15th of March, Luchens began his attack. He managed to um, sink the Empire of Industry, which was formerly the German vessel, the Mankai. Uh, no, for, which was formerly German. And then the Mankai, which was also formerly a German vessel called Scheer. The Silver Fix, the Lamentum, the Grandi, the Royal Crown, the Sidemen Prince, and the French Mason all sunk. And the Chilean Reefer, which was only 1,800 tons, the ship made smoke and return nice and house fire, and believing it was, they, they believed, therefore, it was disguise, it was a disguised enemy cruiser, the Germans withdrew to a safe distance and sank it with their main batteries. Now, it took 73 rounds to destroy. Now, here comes the, uh, the account. Now, the British account, as you know, is Rodney comes over the uh, horizon at full speed and starts chasing uh, the uh, nice now and fires several shells at it and is firing at it and trying to capture it. That's the British version. And it's certainly there is the shell expenditure, which would back that up. Lutchen's account is that what happens is Rodney appears 15 minutes later after he's destroyed this ship and... Um, Flashed the challenge. And so Lutchens identified a Nizer now. And please note. This is what a Sharn horse looks like. Class. And I'm just going to make sure I have this thing on. He sent for an identifying thing. Claiming that the Sharn horse was the HMS Emerald. Just going to put up a photo of the HMS Emerald for you all to compare. The image. Oh, you've updated again. What have you updated? Da, 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 da. I want basic image file. Thank you. Da, 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 da. Yeah, this is HMS Emerald. There you go. So he put up. A, he thinks he managed to um, stop the fight by claiming that he was HMS Emerald. In his report. And apparently, um, this bought him time as he worked up speed to escape, and Rodney stayed to pick up the survivors from the Chilean Reefer. I don't think, A, that at any point did the uh, did HMS Rodney believe that that was a that. I don't. I'm sorry. I'm not sure... Who came up with this idea? I'm not sure where this account comes from. But I've seen it mentioned in about two books. And it seems to uh, go around. But there is no way, under any circumstance, that any British officer mistakes that thing, which is in the middle between the two admirals, for that thing. I'm just sorry it doesn't. Not happening. Um, so, you know, and we also know that R we have Rodney's account. And Rodney's account is she chases him and is firing her guns at him. And is trying to get him within range and get him within close enough range that long enough that she can actually take him out. Now. He manages to get away. He transfers 200 prisoners. He sets course for Brest. He's sighted by aircraft from HMS Ark Royal on the 20th of March. He manages to again evade British warships and reach Brest on the 0700 hours on the 22nd of March. The journey had been 17,800 nautical miles and 59 days at sea. It was a record for German capital ships. It was an absolute record. Mike Phillips, I'm not familiar with HMS Rambles or HMS Did I have spotter planes? I'm trying to get my head around Luchens being able to shadow the convoy without being spotted himself. Um, Malaya was uh, Malaya and Ramleys were both World War One vintage. They hadn't been upgraded, so they didn't really have spotter planes. But as it was, they had. Uh, I don't think Ramleys had radar, but I'm not sure about Malaya by this point. And whilst they had, they were spotting him. They did see notice they were being stalked by ships, but they weren't having a clear return. And it's the case of how do I put this? 
He's shadowing a convoy, but he's not shadowing it that closely. He's not necessarily using his own spotter planes to shadow it. Imagine, you're thinking of shadowing a convoy as being a case of keeping within visual range of the convoy. No, he's keeping in visual range of the smoke. He's seeing the smoke maneuver. He's using his own radar when he has it working to track them, but he's also using the smoke. He's using that visual identification of where their smoke is to keep track with the convoy. And the convoy will proceed at a certain speed. Remember, the convoy is zigzagging because of the threat of German submarines. He's unlikely to run across British submarines in the middle of the Atlantic. Why would they have them on patrol in the middle of the Atlantic? That's British safe space. The British submarines are off on patrol of the German coast. Um, so he doesn't have to worry about zigzagging. The British fleet, the British convoy will be zigzagging. They'll be keeping at a constant speed. It's far easier to keep shadow them than it is to necessarily for them to come out and spot you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Don't know, get back here, you little pro probably. Yeah, Romney was probably shouting at him to come and fight me. Um <sighs> So Operation Berlin, over. It's a great success as far as they are concerned. It's an absolute Victory. There's a small problem with this. Because it's a victory, and his actions are described as being beyond reproach, he invariably judged the situation accurately and he met with the deserved success. Uh, Raider gives him a massively glowing endorsement, and that was part of it. And... While the Sea Krieg Sultong, Sea Krieg Sultong, the basic Admiralty sort of was more critical, they acknowledged the restrictions placed upon Luchans, but thought he could have asked for greater freedom of action, and especially after the encounter of Ramleys. They believed that Hoffman was right, that Ramleys could have been drawn off by the Scharnhorst, and then Neisenau could have attacked the convoy. What I love about those staff officers is none of them are fighting this from the British perspective. At what point do they think it's sensible that a British captain is going to think, you know what, I'm going to chase after a 31-knot battleship in my 21-knot battleship because I stand a chance of catching that thing. And in return, I will leave the convoy I'm protecting alone and unguarded. I will fall for this obvious ruse and I will chase this 31-knot ship Yeah. So then we have Operation Rheinberg, and well, this is a fun one. Okay. Here is the point, and I will. There, there I've got various quotes up there from people about luchens at this point and i read through them in the in the recorded video but the point i'm going to really get into is this when luchens is playing this his motto is that the german navy should not be sent out in teaspoons to uh, teaspoonfuls to be fed to the british royal navy lion you do not feed a lion with teaspoons it just goes yump it doesn't bother it his view that Reinenberg should wait till they have Bismarck, Turpish, Scharnhorst and Neisenau all ready to raid into the Atlantic. That Scharnhorst and Neisenau should probably leave from France, as that's most easy for them to get out, to, uh, get out from. Bismarck and Turpish should leave through the North Sea, and they should meet up in the North Atlantic. The other option was, Scharnhorst and Neisenau should break through, kind of like the Channel Dash, into the English Channel... Uh, by first Bismarck and uh, Bismarck and Turbitz demonstrating in the North Atlantic to draw off British capital ships to go and deal with not there. Then Charles and Eisenhower making the run through the channel. And then all four of them gathering together in Norway. And then from Norway going into the North Atlantic. Hey, Melanie. So. 
all of that is the possibilities they are thinking about. And hello, Runon. I don't think I've said hello already to Zimu. That is the options they are looking at. That is what they're thinking about. That is the considerations they have. And the plans that Luchens wants to do. There's a problem for that. There's a problem to all of this. It means the mustachioed man has to wait. And as we all know, Hitler has two problems. Hitler both hates waiting for anything. He has the attention span of a uh, dead amoeba. And he also hates losing ships. So he both wants Luchens to go out to sea, but he's going to order him not to risk any ships. Now, let's be honest, if you had gone out and attacked with four ships, think about this. Think about that same scenario with Ramleys. Ramleys is there on her own, and Bismarck, Turpit, Sharnhorst, and Nisenau turn up. How's that battle going to go? How quickly is she going to be sunk? Because let's be honest, with 18 11-inch guns and 16 15-inch guns firing at her, there isn't going to be much chance of the 8 15-inch armed old battleship actually surviving. It's not a case of pulling the, her away from a convoy. It's a case of she could be destroyed quickly enough that she wouldn't cause them enough damage for it to be a risk for them to take on such a convoy. So what's the what the Britain have to do? Well, the British would have to prepare a force to match that. And if you have four fast battleships together, the British are going to have to draw together all their fast ships. Now, yes, the odds are by the time Tirpitz, etc. was ready, you'd have... King George V, Duke of York, and Prince of Wales all in service. So you'd have the free King George V's. But think about the other fast ships you'd have ready. What else would you have available? Would you call the Queen Elizabeth, uh, the, uh, the uh, rebuilt Queen Elizabeth back from the Mediterranean fleet? I.e. War Spite, Queen Elizabeth, Valiant? Would you? Could you? Would you have to use Renown, Repulse, and Hood? So that's your six ships. And yes, you've probably got to add on that to that at least two carriers. And by the way, that's six ships and that's the bare minimum. So they've got to all be available to have a superiority of numbers to the, to the German force. And that's to hunt them down. And can you risk having convoys crossing? Because a battle, single battleship is not an escort for them. So do you have to have a slow convoy group or a convoy's escort? You know, how big a ship? Do your convoys have to be escorted by every single R and R old Queen Elizabeth you have? So that's basically the f uh, four remaining R's and the two, uh, two unreconstructed Queen Elizabeths, plus Nelson and Rodney. So those eight ships, do you have to form those into two four-ship groups and every convoy has to sail with them? So that if, you're con if you come in to attack a convoy, you're going to find four of uh, 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 HMS Nelson or HMS Rodney with three... Let's say a Queen Elizabeth and two R's sitting in that convoy to fight you off. Think about it. Think about the drain that would put on the Royal Navy. Just as a fleet in being, let alone if it went out into the North Atlantic. Think about the nightmare scenario for the Royal Navy that would have been. And then think about the fact that the Germans didn't do that. The Germans instead sent their warships out as a single battleship out with a cruiser as a backup. Think about that. And as for the carriers, what would carriers be available? Well, let's be honest, you've got Ark Royal in Force H. Well, if you've got Renown pulled back to be part of the fast group, what's Ark Royal going to be doing? Is she pulled back as well? Probably victorious? And there's no way if those four are in existence as a group together. 
Now, the thing is, you can think of at this point, and this is the point I would make, if all four were based in the same port, imagine how many RAF bombers would be sent to blast that port to pieces. But as you just heard earlier, they had a habit of basing them individually in their own individual ports. So you could base them in four different fjords up the coast of Norway. I do agree, the only option for the Royal Navy might be rapid modernization of Barham and Malaya and also the rapid construction of Vanguard. I think you would see the Royal Navy would churn out Anson and Howe far quicker than they do historically. And I wouldn't be surprised if Vanguard gets finished off a lot quicker and if not, Van maybe a sister of Vanguard gets finished off qu more quickly. And let's be honest, it could go worse because, you see, if you're really sensible, what you do is you stick your four heavy cruisers with your four battleships and suddenly you have a very scary group. And if you're very sensible and you listen to Lutyens completely, you put the four battleships, the four heavy cruisers, and you get your aircraft carrier, the Graf Zeppelin, working, and suddenly you have a nine-ship task force, you take it out into the Atlantic, and the Royal Navy is fighting a friggin' full battle against you. A frigging full battle. Think about that as a scenario. But no, no one listens to Lutyens on this point. Lutyens is arguing, this is what we need to do. We don't need to send out teaspo uh, teaspoons. We need to send out a full frigating force. If all four finish, we see. That is the thing. If you've got that group as a four, depending how long they're sitting there, you might well see a lion done. You might well see the vanguards built, uh, a couple of vanguards built. I, I wouldn't be surprised in the nicest way if you did see a lion, a lion built. The vanguards, I don't think they'd be waiting around for necessarily for the American stuff that they did originally put on vanguard. I think they'd have probably put gone with the British stuff. They'd have gone with whatever was available to get the quick ship quickly in the water, as quickly in the water as they could, and quickly built in service as they could. And I think that's an, the honest scenario you have going on. And I think they do have to they do have to modernize and upgrade Hood and Repulse. But Gary, again, think about this. What gets deployed to the Far East then as Force Z as Ed? Think about that. In this scenario, the Royal Navy is in real trouble. As it is, what happens is Operation Rheinberg, they go, no, 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 we have to send something immediately. Scharnhorst and Neisenau are damaged and in French ports and no one really trusts the French to fix them. They can be uh, they can be fixed up to a certain point, but they're going to have to be brought back to German ports to be properly fixed up and ready for operations. Tirpitz is nowhere near serviceable at this point. It officially is commissioned, but let's be honest, it's not actually in service. It's being worked up still. So Bismarck is the only vessel available. So... In actual fact, you have got one working capital ship at this point, and you're going to send it out on its own into the middle of the Atlantic. Third Squad, do you think the US would have inter intervened with the four-ship group like they were the U-Bucks? Any attack on merchant shipping West of the is an attack on the US? Um... They might try to, but I uh, there's a there's a difficulty for that. And yes, they would probably still have their large crews and maybe even their battleships on patrol. But intervene, yeah, intervene, yes. But that's a good way to start a war, and that's far more difficult to take on. I just like taking on all four battleships. Maxwell, if the Germany cooperated with the Italians on such a venture, it could have allowed for a surge of supplies in the North Africa campaign. Yes. I, was asking, I guess even HMS Iron Duke could get a rapid refit. I think the biggest thing they'd be worried or they'd be missing would be HMS Tiger. Not Iron Duke. It's just, yeah. And so...
The operation is planned by Rolf Karls. And the idea was that the submarines would support Luchans wherever it could. Wherever they could. But they wouldn't move from their normal positions. Luchans made appeals to everyone he could. He went to Raider. Um, he went to everyone he could. And Raider actually wrote of it that, you know, after he'd heard Luchans' arguments, he does it to great credit. They did not hesitate to express his views of me, so frankly. I then sought to convince him of the cogency of my arguments. Although Luchans was perhaps not entirely convinced of my views, our discussion ended in complete understanding. No, it ended when a senior officer ordered his junior officer to go and do his job. To go and do the job he'd assigned him. Telemachus, well, the summary situation, if you hit a man with a log, you kill him. If you split a log into splinters, you can whip a man all you want, but it won't do a thing. Mm, ye with the splinters, yeah. That's good. What about some of the US standards doing the escort for the Western Atlantic? Call a neutrality patrol for the Western Atlantic. Doubt Luchans would risk attacking. You can do all those things, and you might do all those things, but it's going to depend on how well, how much the the, uh, the Americans w risk uh, wish to risk these things. How much do they want to get involved? Because it's one thing saying no to submarines. After World War One, the American position on submarine attacks is well known. It's another thing getting involved or in in the way of what is can be considered as legitimate cruiser operations, and the rules of cruising warfare. Richard, what this shows you is that Washington and London treaties cut too many battleship dreadnoughts from our NES and fleets. Old battleships are useful. It's convoy escorts. In case I met some reserve battleships are good. Enjoy your food, Melanie. Now. What's interesting to me is what Luchin says to Conrad Pazig, who was an old friend of his. Given the uneven relation of forces, I am of the opinion that I should be, have to sacrifice myself sooner or later. I have closed out my private life and am determined to carry out the assignment given to me honourably, one way or another. Please note... Lutyens was also one of the few officers who refused to give the Nazi salute when Hitler visited Bismarck before its fast and final mission, deliberately using the traditional naval salute instead. Could it have been worse if Graf Zeppelin... Yes, well, as I said, if you combine Graf Zeppelin, four battleships, four heavy cruisers, and you send them out as a force into the North Atlantic, the Royal Navy has a lot of trouble. And by the way, I'm not sure I said, but thank you to Jack Ray for the memberships. It's really, really nice, and really, actually, quite important, judging by the... The, the number of memberships are quite important. Just uh, the, the lovely people at YouTube gave me a breakdown of the money I get from the channel, and um, trust me, I would have... If it hadn't been for memberships, and the number of you who are, thanks to Jack and thanks to yourselves, who are members of the channel, um, I would have really noticed the dive in money that they have provided for advertising revenue. I know some of my colleagues on YouTube really have been affected by it. So. Well. You might have realised the reason I'm not going to be on Discord later this evening is because I knew this one was going to go quite long. It's already half past ten and we haven't even got to the actual battle of Denmark Straits yet. So... Lutyens is going, and he's going with the force he can get together. Now, there's a small problem in this force. Okay, there is a small problem in the force he's picked, because he's picked, as his chief of staff, he's picked Admiral Harold Netzbrand. 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 
Yes. Harold Netsband. And Harold was the flag captain for him aboard Nisenau. So why is this a problem? Well, he already... Lindemann is a very different officer than Harold is. Than Netsband. Uh, he is not the same... It doesn't have the same sort of personality traits as, to an extent, as Lutyens does. And... There is already a possibility of problems there. But the fact is, if you have as your chief of staff your former flag captain, who you have a very good relationship with, then it's going to put a barrier in that perhaps to you building up your relationship with your flag captain. Especially when he's taking a chief of staff and full staff, when he's only taking out one battleship and one cruiser. One battleship, one cruiser, and he's taking out... Two captains of seas on his staff. That's a chief of staff and his uh, artillery officer, fleet artillery officer, Emil Melms. He's got a doctor. He's got a meteorologist. He's got um, several staff officers. He's got his own NCOs. He's got his own team coming with him, a full staff, and he's commanding one ship. Sorry. Little moth, which is not going to get to books. Not if I can do anything about it. Yeah, it's gone. Ah, no, it's, it's got a friend. Got it. Sorry. Um, the US might have been quasi involved in the war, but they weren't involved in the war. Remember, there are a lot of very, very, very fine and opaque lines they are unwilling to cross. So they can say they're not actually involved in the war. Now, on the 18th of May, the operation began. And this is, of course, the 18th of May, um, Nineteen forty-one. Why was my brain go dead on nineteen forty-one? I was going nineteen forty-one or forty-two. Forty-one, 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 forty-one. It's before. It's before all of the. Uh, before everything that happens in Pearl Harbor. It's forty-one, forty-one, forty-one. I was going check before you say Alex. Check. Oh, it's fun. Anyway, so on the eighteenth of May, operation began. Lutchens informed Lindemann and Brinkman. Brinkman is the captain of the Prince Jürgen. Lindemann, of course, is the captain of the Bismarck. And this is General Admiral Rolf Karls. And, by the way, this was the person who ho who Radar hoped would succeed him as Chief of the German Navy, not Donitz. He is a far scarier and far brighter individual, but he's also the one who came up with the plan, as was required, for Bismarck to go sailing into the North Atlantic on its own. Oy. Now, on the 21st of May, in Norwegian waters, Lutyens ordered a fuel stop in Grimsford, near Bergen. He didn't bother to inform Lindemann or Brinkman about his decision to uh, drop anchor and refuel. He gave no explanation for the changing of his mind. He didn't have a discussion with his captains at all. And probably didn't think he needed to, because he's probably having discussions with his own staff. And this is a problem, because he should be having a discussion with his captain. But he's got his staff on, and his staff includes his former flag captain, who he's used to having this conversation with. And remember his experience, what he's come up from. From. Anyway, Prince Eugen is refueled and Lutchens declined to top up the, Bis uh, the Bismarck. Later on, um, a rupture in one of the fuel lines had allowed only initial putting of 6,000 tons of fuel. A further 2,000 tons was accepted to sea, so the ship had left Baltic, the Baltic 200 tonnes short and 
had since burned a thousand tons before reaching Norway. Lutyens had this idea that there was a tanker, the Weisenberg was waiting for him in the Arctic. Uh, we fear it. We think he did. We had this idea. He knows certainly that Weisenberg is waiting for him in the Arctic, but we don't know whether it's his idea or not to go to it. An additional day sailing away. But, of course, this is a lot further from British eyes and potential British reconnaissance. However, he does not refuel the Bismarck at all during the operation. So, again, this is very different than with... Uh, Sharnos and nice now, where he took every opportunity to refuel as much as he could. But it does seem to me that he's basically, since he had to inv he had to abandon Bonte and his his force in Narvik, he has been sure that his life is a ticking clock, that he is using up his luck. And Operation Berlin had gone very well, but he'd had some close run things, Malaya, Renown. Rodney, Ramillies had all been fairly close run things. If he'd made mistakes, he could have ended up got lost. And now, and that was when he had two battleships, remember? He had two for that operation. He now has one. Now, on the 22nd of May, he received a report that four British battleships and an aircraft carrier and a strong group of destroyers were anchored in Scapa Flow. This was, of course, wrong, as most German intelligence was in World War II, but, you know, it did influence Lutchen's decision not to loiter and his decide to proceed with the breakout immediately, which is why he doesn't refuel, it seems. Now, Lindemann wanted to go south of Iceland. Uh, he wanted to go through that area, which would have actually taken them to King George V and HMS Victorious. That would have been the intercepting group. So what would have happened under that scenario is Victorious would have kept launching air carriers, uh, airstrikes with her her aircraft as they closed, and then after the strikes had been go had gone in, probably King George V would have started fighting Bismarck. Cruisers would have engaged Prince Jürgen and Admiral Holland in, Ro in Hood, and the Prince of Wales would have raced to try and join them. But no, Lindemann doesn't get his way, and Lutyens... Um, I love the phrase, some would say prevailed. He's the frigating admiral aboard. If the admiral says we go in that direction, the captain can argue. But unless it's the directly impacting the safety of his ship, i.e. you are ordering me to run my vessel aground, you cannot disagree a lawful order from your admiral. So if your admiral wants to go that way and his staff agrees with him, you are going that way, whether you want to go the southern route or not. Now... Carls had also put forward that he wanted a, uh, a breakout through the, uh, the Faroe Isles Iceland Gap route. Um, but, now, here is the point. The Denmark Straits can be more, e the Denmark Straits between Northern Iceland can be more easily patrolled because of the ice flooding. However, it also, because the same reasons, offered lower visibility conditions, which gave options of greater cover, especially against air attack. But that only works if you keep pace with storms. And when Heinz Extenbrink uh, wants to increase speed to keep up with the, uh, the faster moving cloud, um, Lutchen's declines. Now, the reason that Lutchen's probably declines is because of the fuel situation. He's probably thinking, I have only X amount of fuel. If I go fast to keep under the clouds, I will get through fuel far too quickly. That's a problem. Now, the problem, uh, the other problem is that despite all the attempts he's made to avoid being spotted, uh, thanks to the Swedish, the Norwegian resistance and area reconnaissance, the Royal Navy knows exactly where he is. Here comes the other problem. 
It's not just Lutyens who's receiving and his staff who are receiving the German intelligence briefings coming through. Lindemann is also receiving all the German intelligence information coming through. And he had also heard about the contingent of enemy capital ships congregating at Scarpa Flow. He felt, now, at this point, that the operation should probably be called off completely. But only Admiral Lutyens can actually call off an operation. And neither Captain Lindemann or Brinkman could seem to get him to have a conversation with them. He didn't seem to need to have the conversation with them because probably he's having a conversation with his staff. His former flag captain. You see, there's the problem here. Because he's conversing with the same person he's been conversing with all of Operation Berlin. All of those days at sea, he's been conversing and building up the relationship. During Norway Operation, he was conversing without a captain. Now he's got that captain with again. Who is he going to converse with? Black Man Russell, can carry aircraft still attack during battle between service ships that are considered too dangerous? They can still attack. Usually they attack the unengaged side. Or they attack from the forward or aft. Uh, usually they attack from the forward and a, a, or a forward unengaged side. So if they hit the, if their torpedoes miss and run on, they will go away from the, from the engage, from their allied ship. Because if their ships are both moving in this direction, engaging, and let's say they're sort of they're going to be like that, but they're sort of roughly sort of like that. And if you attack, uh, let's say uh, this is this is the enemy ship. If you attack from this side, you attack through your own line of fire and can get hit by your shells. But if you attack from here, um, or rather, no, from here, it's again you get own line of shells. And if I'm swap hands quickly for the ship, because I can do it more easily, if you attack from here, you could hit your own ship, which remember is sailing on here, so it could get the torpedoes go past. But if you attack from here, the torpedoes will go behind your own ship and could well hit this ship. So you usually attack from forward of the un uh, forward unengaged side. Like, that's not well, that's presuming his staff are the yes-men. They're not yes-men. It's just they're not the people he needs. To, he needs to be having a conversation also with his flag captain, but he's not having it with him. And Carl's is getting no communication from him. But on 22nd of May, he shared his intention to breach Denmark Strait with his captains. And... He was told that this was uh, this was viable, in fact, because Force H was apparently, according to German intelligence at this point, one of the things they said, was probably engaging. Um, and again, I'm not quite sure I believe this. I don't think anyone tells him that Force H is involving in, in the Battle of Crete. Mediterranean Fleet might be involved in the Battle of Crete, but I don't think Force H was. And I don't think anyone who knows that Royal Navy, that the ship Force H is based on Gibraltar is going to think the Royal Navy's brought it through more, uh, for, uh, Malt, the sort of the Straits of Malta, that area, in narrowing in the middle of the Mediterranean, to go and engage in Crete. I don't think anyone thinks that is going to think that. So I don't think that's the case. I think he thinks that the Battle of Crete's region, so the Royal Navy's focused on that. And Force H is therefore going to be focused to cover the Western Mediterranean. Because the Eastern Mediterranean is going to be so busy. So therefore it can't come out into the Atlantic. So therefore the force available to the Atlantic are even less. That's the more of the theory than thinking Force H is going to the Met uh, Battle of Crete. But. He goes through the, he goes through the straits. It's only on the 23rd of May that he realises the British were tracking him. When... He encounters HMS Norfolk and Suffolk amidst the Greenland ice pack. Now, they actually identify Norfolk as Suffolk and Suffolk as Norfolk. Yeah. They read their ship's numbers and they manage to decide that Norfolk is Suffolk and Suffolk is Norfolk.
he decided to give the permission to open fire. And shots were fired by both Bismarck and by Prince Jürgen. Um, no serious damage resulted as the British cruisers quickly withdrew out of range. They remained within radar range and continued to shadow the, the German ships. And here's the really annoying thing. And we talk about the Prince of Wales being a new ship that's still being tested. But they found actually at this point that her heavy guns firing had disabled Bismarck's own search radar. So Prince Jürgen has to take the lead. As they actually try to swap positions, the Bismarck's uh, push button wheel managed to jam, and it actually veered towards the German cruiser. And you had a very real, a very real near scenario of Bismarck smashing into the Prince Jürgen, which would probably cause a sunk the Prince Jürgen, but could have well caused so much damage to the Bismarck that she would have actually had to go home, or probably would have been caught on the way home. Because remember, they, she's being shadowed by. British cruisers, so the British battleships were being pulled in, and Prince uh, Prince Jürgen would have been sunk, and Bismarck would have been dealing with massive damage to her bow. But luckily, luckily, Brinkman manages to think quickly and avoid it. And that's the captain of Prince Jürgen. Now. It carries on, and during a um, particularly interesting rain, a, a rain event, a rain squall, uh, Lutchen's attempts what can be described as a 180, 180 hard turn to try and su surprise the British cruisers. But their radar detected a manoeuvre and they managed to withdraw. This caused Lutchens to start to believe they possessed the radar, a new one, which was a system as yet unknown to the British because it was so powerful. Push button wheel, yes. Uh, they had, uh, Bismarck had an electric push button wheel system. So instead of having an hydraulic, it had electric steering. Now, early hours of the 24th of May, as we all know, and I'm not going to go into too much details on the Battle of Denmark Straits because really I don't need to go into all the details of Hood and Holland's positions. And Holland is actually a fairly good officer to look at and give us a counterpart to, uh, to Lutyens because, let's be honest, um, Lutyens joined... The German Navy in... Well, he joined in 1907. Holland had joined in 1902. Holland was 53 in 1941. Lutyens was 52. Now, before he commanded, became vice admiral, he'd be in battle cruiser squadron. He took command of in 1941. Prior to that, he commanded the 18th cruiser squadron, 1940-41. Prior to that, he commanded the third battle squadron, 1939 to 1940. He'd commanded the Channel Force in 1939, the second battle squadron, 1939. He'd been in charge of Royal Navy barracks, 1936 to 37, in Portsmouth. He provided that he commanded HMS Revenge, HMS Hawkins, HMS Vindictive, and HMS Kite. He commanded HMS Kite 1916 to 18, Vindictive in 1929, Hawkins 1929 to 31, and Revenge 1934 to 35. In other words, he'd had seagoing commands and mostly senior commands for pretty much the last decade and a half. He had a lot of experience. Now, he's coming in hard, fast and hard. He's trying to do his best to position his ships. What Lutyens does is he's sitting there thinking about his own tactical position. Because as soon as he spots the ships coming towards him, 
Luchin's turned away to try and gain time to think and to plan a response to his opponents. They're going to engage him. Now, there is another small problem. Once the lead enemy vessel is identified as Hood, he's very reluctant to start to engage them. This is because he'd been told Hood was nowhere near. Hood was supposed to be off the coast of Africa. Hood was supposed to be in the Mediterranean. Hood was supposed to be nowhere near where she was, as far as German intelligence was concerned. Now, you have to also remember, in Operation Berlin, etc., he had used up a lot of ammunition fighting at long range inefficiently. And this was the beginning of an operation where he was supposed to sink a lot of ships. He couldn't afford to use up all his ammunition at this point, especially if he's already engaging battleships. He has to save his ammunition. So, first of all, after Hood begins to fire, Lutyens doesn't return fire with his main guns. He orders Prince Jürgen to open fire on lead enemy ship, but not Bismarck. The fleet gunnery officer keeps makes uh, keeps uh, making uh, requests to return fire. Lutyens, remember, he is an artillery specialist, doesn't. He wants the range to fall. He wants to not. He doesn't want to use up the ammunition he like he did in the previous engagements, uh, in you know the previous battles. When he was doing Operation Berlin, he wants to save his ammunition. <laughs> Lindemann is not very happy about this. But Lutyens waits till he orders a turn to port and crosses Holland's T. With Holland attempting to cross his T as well. It's a, it's a fun scenario. They're both attempting to cross each other's tea at the same time. And that's when the Bismarck opens fire. Now, as we all know, in this operation, Hood gets sunk. But what's important for us is what Bismarck is, uh, what Lutyens is doing in terms of tactical operations. He orders the Prince Jürgen to stay in the line against German tactical doctrine, but to maximize his firepower firing at the enemy until Hood goes. And then he orders it to fall out and fall back to the position it's supposed to be in. Now, here is when the inter other interesting thing comes up. Lindemann wants to chase down the Prince of Wales. Remember, this is the guy who'd been earlier on very worried about the Royal Navy having four battleships. He wants to chase down the Prince of Wales and sink it. He's eager for blood. But Lutyens goes, no, we can't do this. Why? Why can't you chase down the Prince of Wales? Well, let's think about this more sensibly. So let's say you go chasing after Prince of Wales and she's trying to get away. She's got the cruisers with her. They can start joining in the fight. But there's also probably more British ships coming in. That Prince of Wales will be shouting out radio signals. So will the other cruisers. Uh, so will the cruisers be shouting out radio signals. King George V will be steaming as far as she can to get there. But more importantly, Victorious's aircraft will all be coming in. Everyone will be trying to get there. Oh, my, my only question for them was right. Did the quote, I will not have my ship shot out from under me, my, actually happen? Potentially, but potentially not. It, Lindemann does seem to be annoyed, but I doubt it's exactly that phraseology. But that's the phraseology which has survived in history. Now, and also, here is the other problem for Lutyens. He knows that Hood wasn't supposed to be there. He knows none of these ships were supposed to be there. And yet they were. 
they were. And what did that mean for their own intelligence? So he pulls back. He pulls away. Now, on the 25th of May, today, his birthday, he managed, even though he was exhausted by this point and constant, doing constant action, he managed to order quite a... Well, an interesting idea of a manoeuvre. Where have I put my... Oh, I've drunk my own brew. I didn't realise I drank my own brew. No wonder I'm starting to have problems with my voice. Um, do I go for more iron brew or do I finish off my bottle of water? Finish off my bottle of water. Finish off my bottle of water. That's probably better for me. Um, especially as I need to actually get some sleep. I'll try to. Now, he manages to... Well, he notices that the British cruisers are zigzagging. Because as we all know, British cruisers are paranoid about submarines. So even when they are stalking you, they are zigzagging. And they presume he's going to try and take them onto submarines. They presume he's going to do that. But his birthday, he decides to try another manoeuvre. At the outer edge of their zigzag, their port turn, they'd be at the limit of what he felt was their radar's range. So, what he did was he ordered full speed. And then... A three-quarter turn in a clockwise direction. I think about that. Three quarters turn. So instead of doing a hundred and eighty degrees turn, he's doing a hundred and thirty-five degrees. To starboard. And this allowed him to escape the enemy radar. Steam in the opposite direction. And then actually sail across their wake and avoid them again. Avoid their attempts to regain contact. It managed to break contact. It's great. But at this point... He had broken contact, but he decided to break radio silence. As he believed he was still being tracked. Naval Group Rest informed him to send tactical radio signals. And not risk broadcasting long messages to Paris. Since they were sure that he had broken contact. But Lutyens didn't believe intelligence anymore. Intelligence had told him Hood was, in the, uh, Hood was off the coast of Africa. Hood was in the Mediterranean. Hood was not supposed to be there fighting him. But Hood had been. He therefore didn't believe intelligence was right in their assessment, so he disregarded what they were saying and trusted his own gut. And his own gut was he was being followed. And remember, this is a man who has said, who has already said earlier, this. Given the uneven relation of forces, I am of the opinion that I should have to sacrifice myself sooner or later. I have closed out my private life and returned to carry out the assignment given to me honourably, one way or another. This is the man who'd been sure that if he was sent out, he needed to go with maximum force to stand a chance of actually doing the job. They'd send him out with the minimum force. He damaged that minimum force because she had got damaged in the fight. And now they were doing the, and now they were being tracked and he was sure of it. He didn't believe anything they were telling him. It took the 25th of May for the British and especially certain admirals in charge to realise he was heading for France. Which meant he was pretty far ahead of his pursuers at this point. The trouble was those same messages allowed mm -hmm, hello a pretty lady called Ark Royal to get involved. 
the yes, the 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 tribal class destroyers were already racing to intercept as well. It's starting to sound like a giant I told you so. It is starting to sound like a giant I told you so. Um, basically, at this point, he Lutyens is following a policy of radioing until they acknowledge his, his response. So he and he's radioing all the naval commanders to tell them all what is going on. And as such, the, on board the Prince Jürgen, Captain Brinkman. Um, records in the war diary that Lutyens insistence on radioing every change of course to the shore commands, then confirmed by a final execute order, was unnecessary and risky. It was also... Um, how do I put this? Giving the information, British a lot of information to work with. But he believed he was under surveillance by the British, so he didn't foresee there being any problem. He, they already know where I am, so why bother with hiding where I am and not sending the information I need to send through? At 8.01 on 25th of May... He'd actually radioed Naval High Command with his intent to sail to St. Nazaire and attach his heavy cruiser for commerce operations. Now, the ship, the Bismarck by this point was noted they'd done a damage the report and he knew it was down by the bow where it had been hit. Uh, that shell had severed the fuel lines to the forward fuel tanks and by allowing seawater to pour in through the hole located just above the waterline. And, well, pretty much. It was in a bad state. It was. Th this is the point again. I've often made about surface raiders. They can win a fight, but if they even if they win a fight, they're going to be damaged and they're going to be in trouble. And this is complicated furthermore by the fact that he had not refueled. So, when Lutyens is taking stock of the situation, and what he believes at this point, he believes he is being shadowed by a force of Royal Navy ships, which he believes have a magical superior radar. Well, not even magical, just a very advanced superior radar. Radar. That's how he believes he was found in the first place, by Norfolk and Suffolk. He believes they have a far more superior radar than they actually do have. He doesn't believe it was intelligence. And remember, he's not alone. Most of the Germans don't believe anyone's cracked Enigma, etc. Uh, secondly, he knows the impairment of surprise has been lost, and this is true. Thirdly, he knows he's running low of fuel because he hadn't refueled and because of the damage to the ship. Uh, fourthly, he believes a force that is led by King George V is probably trying to trap him. And trying to lead him into a trap with an enemy fleet. And his belief is this. His belief is that he is being shadowed by a force directed by King George V. And that he is being driven towards Rodney and Nelson who are lying in wait. His absolute belief is that the British have Rodney and Nelson sitting somewhere in front of him. Waiting for him to come to him. He That he is being driven forward inexorably towards... These mighty battleships, which are going to rip his ship to pieces. Actually, at this point, Rodney's charging around going, Where is the Bismarck? But that's just what neither here nor there. Um, Captain Darrell Hamilton is trying to find exactly where 6th gear is. He's fit, or maybe probably 7th gear at this point. He's found 6th gear. He's trying to find a 7th one and going, I'm sure we can make it faster if we try. Now... At this point, he gets into, and, and finally, also, please note, the seawater that's getting into his ship, the issues of damage to his hull, is actually slowing his top speed by two knots, at the least. So if you think about that, Bismarck's theoretical top speed was supposed to be 30 knots, which he'd hit during trials. But in effect, usually she's actually 29-ish knots. 
Now, we know she hit 30 knots in Schratz. The good thing about the German archives is that, of course, after World War II, they were cracked wide open. But we'll leave that to one side. Um, so, if she's down roughly 29 knots when normal in normal non-trial conditions, and she's going 2 knots, she's probably doing 27 knots. Which means now, Rodney, who maxes out theoretically, whose official top speed is 23 knots, but whom Lutyens himself believes, and has stated before, believes was going up to nearly 26 knots when chasing him in Nisenau, uh, you, 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 you're starting to get an idea here why Luchin is getting worried. Well, so with this, Lindemann is arguing to return via the Denmark straight to Norway. Remember, this is the same guy who was who's kept... Uh, please note, Lindemann is, does not cover himself in glory here. I can almost understand Lutchen's not bothering to pay to talk to, talk to him. Uh, the guy wanted to be... Uh, go and attack... Go and attack the Prince of Wales and fight in battle, and then afterwards he's going, we need, need to run away. If you're so damaged you need to run away now, which you were after the battle already, why were you wanting to go and chase the Prince of Wales? Um, it's, it's basically, he jumps backwards and forwards from being overly aggressive to being overly pessimistic. And this is actually most seen in the end and some of the results you have at the end. Lutyens rejected this as it would take him too close to the British Isles and expose him to the greatest concentration of enemy sea and air coastal forces. So instead, he's trying to make for the same port which he took Scharnhorst and Nisenau into. He's trying to basically meet up with them. And it's at this point, really, on the 25th, 26th of May, that basically Lindemann and Lutyens, um, their staff, start arguing with each other. Now, the, the plan is for Lutyens, well, he's choosing to make the longer journey, and so the shorter journey is to Norway, which is better for the fuel, but the longer journey to Norway into a French port was basically there's more likely to have and whilst you can get it's shorter to get to Norway, the ports in France are more likely able to repair the Bismarck. So if you go to Bismarck, you're more likely to be able to get out and use it again. Furthermore, and that's it, this is important. Furthermore, furthermore to this, to all this. Lutyens was trying to organise a concentration of U-boats south of Greenland to attack his shadowers. And that's one of the reasons why he's sending the information he's through, is through. He's sending the information through, he's broadcasting all the details he is, because he's trying to arrange for submarines to attack his shadowers. So with all this in mind, Lutyens gives out this inspiring speech. Surviving crew members of Bismarck. Sorry, wrong line. Roll from my own notes there. Um, yeah. Okay. So I've got notes below which start off with surviving crew members of Bismarck, which... I have basically copied a passage out of a book I have to make. I've basically copied a paragraph from Ballard's, uh, Robert Ballard's um, Discovery of Bismarck, The Greatest Battleship Surrenders a Secrets book. It's a very good book, by the way, but I've basically, as you all in my notes, I do... They're my notes reading. I do copy out paragraphs. Where it's a good one, and then I annotate them, and I have it highlighted. It's lovely, but I read the wrong paragraph. The paragraph above it is what I'm supposed to be aiming for, but, uh, yeah. A little bit tired this evening. <sighs> right, to the correct paragraph. Seamen of the battleship Bismarck, you have covered yourself with glory. The sinking of the battlecruiser Hood was not only military, but psychological value. For she was the pride of Great Britain. Henceforth, the enemy will try to concentrate his forces and bring them into action against us. I therefore released Prince Jürgen at noon yesterday so that she could conduct commerce warfare on her own. 
She's managed to evade the enemy. We, on the other hand, because of the hits we have received, have been ordered to proceed to the French port. On our way there, the enemy will gather and give us battle. The German people are with you, and we will fight until our gun barrels glow red hot and the last shell has left the barrels. For us seamen, the question is victory or death. For some reason, surviving crew members of the Bismarck state this did not uh, give them a great morale boost. I can't think why. For some reason, and I'm, I know I'm reading that paragraph's opening line off verbatim, but, you know, it's a good paragraph. Thank you, Robert. Uh, uh, thank you, um, Robert Ballard. Uh, for some reason, the surviving crewmen of the Bismarck state that received this message was not a morale boost. In fact, they interpreted mostly that the animal didn't think they'd survive, which, let's be honest, he'd already told someone he didn't think they were going to survive. And an hour later, Lindemann had to give a speech where he spoke of U-boats and Luftwaffe that were gathering to help them home. So basically, one gave a, yes, we're going to get rousing home speech, and one tried to give people an honest assessment. On the 26th of May, a, saw a air swordfish aircraft from HMS Ark Royal spotted the Bismarck thank by following its oil slick. At dusk, Ark Royal's aircraft attacked. They didn't get many hits, but one torpedo jammed Bismarck's rudders and steering gear. And whilst Lindemann believed it could be repaired, Lutyens didn't really think it could be. In fact, was very quick to accept the worst. Um, in fact, uh, even as Lindemann and his engineering officers were trying to work out how to repair the damage, they were considering doing things like um, detaching the hangar doors and using them as temporary rudders. Lutyens compiled a note to the German command and people uh, within 30 minutes. Let's put it this way. I'm sorry, this is going to sound terrible. But whilst I can agree that Lutyens perhaps should have been waiting for the confirmed divers to confirm what he already suspected, um, if it's in a situation where you're honestly thinking your best scenario is to cut off, in the middle of the ocean, cut off your hangar doors... And use them somehow to replace your rudder. You're pretty much up the, without a paddle, or oh, up the pa up the creek without a rudder at least. Uh, it's you're in a pretty bad situation. If you're in that kind of situation, please and listen to me out here. If the situation isn't that bad that you are considering using doors from your hangar as your rudders, it's not good. So, you can argue that, yes, he should be more positive and waited for a report but in, from the actual Lindemann and his officers, but uh, Lutyens was actually basically already telling High Command, we are mocked. We are not going to get out of this. The crew was only able to steer Bismarck by adjusting revolution speed of her propellers, and her top speed was now seven knots. So, and furthermore, during the night, she is joined by great fun. HMS Cossack, Sikh, Maori, Zulu, and ORP Purin uh, decide to turn up under Captain Vian. And, um, well, they keep up an incessant torpedo attack the whole night long. As the night went on, Rodney arrived. Force H, along with HMS Dorsetshire, approached from the south. HMS Edinburgh, i.e. HMS Belfast's sister, was coming from the west. And, well, she's surrounded by destroyers who are broadcasting her position while also attacking her at every chance they get.
Jack Wright, did no one raise the idea of abandoning a scuttling instead of getting a few thousand dead for no real gain? I mean, actual scuttling. Uh, no, because that would be dishon That would not be honourable. And you have to remember, Lutchens is all about honour. Remember what he said. Given the uneven uh, relation of force, I'm the opinion that I shall have to sacrifice myself sooner or later. I have closed out my private life and determined to carry out the assignment given to me honourably, one way or another. Honourably. 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 It's that. And so... He sends a message. Uh, now, here is the thing. This is the one which often gets people to go, oh, he's a Nazi. This is why they think he's a Nazi. Because he sends a message to the Führer of the German Reich, Adolf Hitler. We will be a fight to the end, thinking of you, confident as in a rock of the G victory of Germany. Now, please note. That's basically using the title of his leader, he's using the leader's name, thinking of you and confidence of rock in the victory of Germany, basically it's thinking of you as a country, thinking of you as being, it's all these things, it doesn't seem you mean, necessarily mean you personally, it's basically the kind of message a jet admiral who's decided that he's going to fight to the end is going to send. Now, here is the really interesting thing, because at this point, people have different views on what the moods are. But one of the interesting things you go upon is one of the seamen who survived. It was quite interesting, because one of the seamen saw Lindemann, and Lindemann was walking around wearing a full, wearing his life jacket. So... As he ate his breakfast. The captain was wearing his life jacket already. As he ate his breakfast. That's confidence inspiring. And when he saluted him, he didn't return his salute. But when he met Lutchens, Lutchens returned his salute, but said nothing. They pretty much retreated, both retreated into their own private worlds, but one seems to be acknowledging external stimuli, the other one doesn't. Next message, on the 27th of May, 1941, Lutchen sent a request for a U-boat to pick up the ship's war diary, and his last transmission, ship no longer manoeuvrable, we fight to the last shell, long live the Fuhrer. Hmm. I would say that if you're dealing with dictatorship, the last line could be more about making sure everyone's families are okay within that dictatorship than anything else. Lutchens didn't hide the fate from his crew. He ordered the stores to be opened and allowed the crew to help themselves. What's interesting is Lutchens orders this, not Lindemann. And it is very much known it was Lutchens who ordered it. And this, to me, shows that Lindemann really has, in some ways, gone into his... Um, uh, Lindemann seems to almost, as I said, waver between being absolutely uh, super aggressive to... Ah! Super aggressive to... Ah! And Lutchen seems to be depressed the whole time, but he's not going from one extreme to the other. And this is just from my reading of the history. So please note, I'm not doing any psychological analysis in terms of their emotions or what they're saying. It's just what I'm reading from the history, what seems to be going on. Now, Bismarck's alarm sounded for the last time at 0800 hours on the 27th of May, 1941. Norfolk sighted her at 0815 hours. HMS Rodney opened fire first at 0848 hours. She, uh, Bismarck returned fire at 0849 hours against Rodney. 
Uh, King George V joined in soon after, but honestly, Rodney wasn't waiting for King George V and didn't give a flying hoot how long it took King George V to get involved. It wasn't her involved. In fact, when you go through the battle logs and a lot of you sort of read the destruction details, it seems to be a large amount of damage comes down to Rodney. Now, what we do know is that the forward command position was hit on Bismarck at 0853 hours, and this put and both forward gun turrets were put out of action by 0902 hours. Uh, Albert Schneider, who had been the ship's gunnery control officer, um, was killed in the main gun director. The after gun position was destroyed, uh, uh, control position was controlled at 0918 hours, and turret Dora was disabled at 0924 hours. And she received further heavy hits at 0940 hours, resulting in a fire midships, and turret Caesar was out of action at 0950 hours. Most of these hits were down, and most of these turrets being knocked out were down to Rodney. King George V did do some stuff, but Rodney was doing the really heavy damage. Some secondary weapons positions survived and carried on firing, but all weapons had fallen silent, uh, silent by 1000 hours. Um, at this point, Rodney and King George had, had V started to leave. Now... What I would say Bismarck is of course is the Germans may or may not have been preparing to scuttle. We're not sure what command structure was in place on Bismarck by this point, and let me put explain why. Okay? There are various discussions about who might have been in command, who might have issued orders, whether they were scuttling it or not, or before torpedoes fired by Dorsetshire hit the ship and sank helped sink it. Um what we do know is that a lot of the crew are dead. And what we also know is that Lutyens had probably been killed when a 16-inch salvo fired by Romney destroyed the bridge and killed many, potentially the vast majority, of their senior officers. Combined with the various command positions being taken out, which were where other senior officers were supposed to be in the event of it being wiped out, and some of them being wiped out before the bridge was taken out, there is a part, quite a possibility that there is no command structure in place aboard the Bismarck when she, uh, when uh, at that point. In fact, the most senior officer to survive the entire, the, the, op uh, the operation, if we sort of go back quite a long way, my notes, was um, Burkhard Ferrer von Müller uh, Rickberg, who was, well, I think he was a lieutenant at that point. He was, well, he must have been, he must have been 31, actually, so he probably was more senior than a lieutenant. He was possibly a lieutenant commander rank. Sub Lieutenant 1934. Yeah, he was a, a Lieutenant Commander and he was the fourth artillery officer. And so, yeah, if there's a, only a Lieutenant Commander aboard who survives, honestly, we're not sure who's actually alive and running the things. So, the fact is, most of the senior officers are dead. No submarine had arrived to pick up Bismarck's war diary and. Yeah. They're all gone. So, Lutyens. Useful idiot or misunderstood leadership? I would say personally a bit of both, but I'm interested to hear what you all think. Yes, God. Could the message also have been somewhat sarcastic? I have no idea. I, I don't think that was really Lutch in the style. I don't think that was Lutch in the style.
But this is, let's be honest, he ran from Romney when she was possibly backing up in Renown. Uh, he'd been stopped by Rodney and Renown for his entire career. The only annoying thing at this point is King George V keeps it. Renown isn't allowed to join the fight. Because it could have been Renown and Rodney. And King George V, I suppose. But, you know, because they'd probably, the Admiral insisted to be there. But Renown is not a long way away. And honestly, let's be honest, uh, let's consider it. You know, Renown and Rodney have chased Lutyens throughout his career. It's almost there. It's almost there, right? That at least one of them's there at the end. Also, I think the most unlikely thing that happened is the surviving crews start abandoning ship. They don't close door, doors by them, and the flooding is able to spread more quickly. Yeah, and let's be honest, there's already holes and sinks in the holes in the ship thanks to the shell fire and the damage to the hull, and the torpedoes just finished that all off. The Cox, an armored, uh, argument for an armored conning tower. How much armor are you going to put up there that you're going to resist a 16-inch shell salvo hitting you at that range? And remember, that's all going to be top weight, high up in the ship. Lieutenant. 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 It's Lieutenant. It's Lieutenant. Yeah. That's how it's spelled. That's how it's pronounced. So, that has been over four hours of uh, live, so I hope you've enjoyed that. As said, I'm sorry there's going to be no Discord this evening. I am going to go in after this because I have been up since X hour this morning. We've been to a very fun conference over the last few days. I can highly recommend Defence Leaders. I've also, also been up north to do um, TV recording. It's been fun. Longboat, my opinion based on this is started off as a useful idiot, but evolved into a competent admiral. Oh, he was a competent admiral. He was just not as experienced as he needed to be, and he was not given any of the tasks he was supposed to be. He wasn't a brilliant admiral. He was a competent admiral. He knew what the reality he was facing. Sean Green, fair assessment of his effect overall. I still really wonder about the effects of the drugs if they had access to them. Seems he was sober, whereas others were facing having various effects from overuse. Potentially. I think the reality is he was a human being and he was in a situation which his career in some ways had prepared him for in other ways hadn't and he tries his best but I think the trouble is he also knows exactly what he's facing and he it's gonna sound strange he's a good officer in that he's competent but he's not a brilliant officer because a brilliant officer could have turned that situation into something but a good officer can only try and do his best and what I mean by brilliant I mean well I did look at it and think how would I have done it and it's one of the things I was looking at when I was looking at this microphone what would I have done and I'd have been so tempted so so tempted to okay so this is me if i'd been going to do it i'd have gone the route where they didn't think i was going to go i'd have put up a british flag on my stern and uh, on the, the prince Jürgen. i'd pretend to be british crew a british cruiser in a british battleship fast transit and i'd have gone down the coast of ireland i would have gone from the, instead of going up the, all that sort of the, the, I'd have gone through the Faroes Iceland Gap and I've gone down the coast of Ireland and I'd have pretended to be a British ship the whole way down and I can guarantee I'd look close enough 
close enough to a British battleship that I might not get investigated that closely. And I might be able to sneak past. Because who is going to think about a British battleship and a, a German ba I think a German battleship would charge down the west coast of Ireland? Who? The only thing more incredible would be go through the Irish Sea. And the trouble of doing that is there are enough ships going around that you could run into trouble. Whereas the west coast of Ireland is not going to be patrolled by Royal Navy warships. And unlikely, if you keep far enough out to sea, but close enough to the coast, it's unlikely the Irish are going to stop you either. But that is me willing to take a massive gamble and push my luck. Whereas, in the nicest way, I'm doing that as a hypothetical. I'm not putting my own life on line, really. Whereas he was. And so he was thinking, well, I know the Denmark Straits works because I've done the Denmark Straits. He's kind to recreate Operation Berlin. Thanks, Sean Quigley. Thank you, Andy, and thank you, Joss Funk. Thank you, everyone, for watching. I Thank you, Tim Moran. Thank you, John Shea. Thank you, 20th July, 1944. And Pluffcoff and William Cox. Thank you, everyone. I hope you enjoyed it. Let's see for it. 16-inch salvo at what range? Uh, they were getting down to very, very close range. Um, it was... <sighs> there are debates of how close they get. Um... There are debates about how close they get in that particular battle. Uh, it's... <sighs> there is quite a possibility that Rodney got down to 17,000 yards. There is quite a possibility of that. And possibly even closer. Rodney, we know, did close uh, well, after Bismarck's main gunnery, uh, main battery turrets were out of action by about 9.30 hours. Rodney closed to around 3,000 yards. Now, we know she closes to 3,000 yards at that point, but we have an interesting debate. We know she's been closing the whole time. She's been getting closer and closer. She starts her engagement at 25,000 yards. She finishes her engagement at 3,000 yards. At the point at which she seems to be picking off individual turrets with salvos, we are not sure how close we are, but we think it's below 18,000. So she's really, really close for something with 16-inch guns. Thank you, David Gordon. Thank you, Jack Ray. Thank you, Leslie Mitchell. Thank you, John the Recluse. Isn't that considered sort of piracy? Uh, as long as you don't actually attack another ship while under another flag, it doesn't matter. You're just sailing with a flag while you're running over down. It's yeah, it's 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 iffy, but it's not. You know, how are they going? What what's anyone going to do to you? You're a warship. The worst they're going to do is come and fight you, which is what they're going to do anyway. So you know. Hey, today's video from Battleship New Jersey is how does the captain ask for help? Very difficult. I mean, it's, I think it's inexcusable to continue blaming the radio like that. Have some evidence you're being tracked. Yeah. Magnus, we've taken the measure of the Iron Model 1. We wouldn't match them with all our effort then. It's worse now. You want me to go? I go. I expect to lose, but I will go. Yeah. Thanks for a view on a misunderstood commander. Yeah. That's what the Irish were reporting all the ship movements to the British by telephone contacts with the Admiralty. It's a very big risk. Yes, but would they report a British battleship going along? That's the thing. Thank you, Jeff Brown. Thank you, everyone. Take care, and yeah, as I said, I'm going to head off now. How close were the 16 inch in the Conning Tower? I think they were about 17,000, if not 16,000. I think they were about 17,000 yards at that point, judging by the timing and the tracking. But the track for... The, the, the track for HMS Rodney goes a bit iffy on the mapping. It gets a bit iffy at certain points. It really does. Um... It's like they 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 
claim first officer Hans Oll decide, uh, the, issued the order to scuttle the Bismarck, but there's also the fact that several of the positions he was supposed to be in during the battle are actually positions which were destroyed. So is he actually alive, or do they just... We don't know. It's a complete... It, the, the thing started to fall apart in terms of commanding officers. It could have been um, Gerard Nurk. Uh, the senior surviving engineering officer who issued the order. Thank you, Tenef America, for being... But, you know, there, there's so many things with the, the end of this one. Um, and Rodney is just getting closer and closer and closer. And those 16... This is, you have to remember, this picture is taken. That smudge of smoke over there is Bismarck. And that's Rodney firing. And Rodney is just getting closer and closer and closer. Anyway, thank you very much for watching, everyone. Hope you've enjoyed, and uh, yeah. Thank you. And next week we have, let's see, it's... Uh, it's learning lessons from war. How navies do it about the process of analyzing conflict and learning from it on Tuesday. And then, of course, we have brew, uh, brew ships on Sunday. And then next Thursday, we have the glorious 1st of June. Because it is the glorious 1st of June. That's going to be a long one. And, um, yeah, then I'm off to Australia. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for your support on Ship Shape. There is a link down below because all support is greatly received. And greatly appreciated. Uh, it's how do I put this? We are have been overwhelmed by support, and thank you very much. It's made it possible. Thank you very much, Alt ninety two. Thank you, Night six hundred one, Fluffkoff. Thank you, everyone. And have fun. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Take care. Yes, we are finishing this as we began with Rodney.